Song Dog Mafia, Jason, Cody, and then we got the one and only Tony Tebby here. We we're excited to do this, weren't we, Tony? We kind yeah. of get together and talk some predator talk. I, I don't feel like uh, it gets done enough. There's a lot of guys out there experienced or green that have a lot of questions. Um, and somebody on your statue that's you know, been in the game for quite a long time, it's kind of nice to sit and talk predator <laughs> talk with you. So, you know, it's something that we've come down here. This is our third year here with you, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And um, we started using Tony Tebby sounds a few years ago, and uh, we knew they were some of the best on the market, if not the best on the market. And that's the way we feel, and we knew they were great. And then it just kind of worked into a working relationship with us, and yeah. we started using your sounds, and then we started becoming pretty good friends, and uh, here, here we are. We are. You, like, you like what I did, I liked what y'all did. And so here we are. Yep. One of the things that we wanted to do is just kind of get into what we do in Missouri, what you do here in New Mexico, and it's just go, let's, let's go with your history. Let's go with your past and how you got to okay. where you are right now. Okay. I'm originally from Illinois, and so I lived in Illinois till I was 30. Um, then I moved to Iowa for a period of time as well. So I grew up in the Midwest, started calling coyotes when I was 14, and uh, so I'm quite familiar with, with what you talk about. You, Missouri's a lot more wooded, but we definitely had some wooded hunting back in Illinois. I preferred the open land just because I like to see them coming, but I ended up moving to New Mexico a number of years ago and uh, started a guiding business and uh, focused on education, and that's what I did. And then, so now you produce, not only do you do the guiding, you produce sounds. Yes, sir. Um, you produce hand calls. You produce, I mean, there's a lot of things yeah, that you... Yeah, yeah, and I've been a hand call builder for a long time. I, I, uh, I was a custom hand call builder for 20 years, and... Uh, and then that got a, out of hand. Um, so I came out with a production line, which I still sell today. And um, <clears throat> slowed down on the, the actual hand making each one, There's just not enough hours in the, in the day. Um, and then started recording sounds. And my hand call sales, I noticed over the years, started going down. Um, as I look on the internet and everyone's electronic call, electronic call, electronic call. Um, Unfortunately, the, the hand calling was becoming a dying breed. So if you can't beat them, you join them. I started producing my sounds. Um, I wanted to make sounds that were different than everybody else's, you know. You know, if I catch a rabbit, I want to record from the second I grab him to the time he expires or he's just done squealing. Um, and then I turn him loose. And uh, so some of my recordings are 15, 17 minutes long. So I got, I didn't care for the 20 second loop over that was just, just rhythmic, you know, and if I can predict in the rhythm of it, so can an animal, yeah. you know, and plus I'll fall asleep after about three minutes into the stand. <laughs> that kind of something going, oh, so, yeah, I've heard this one before, yep. yep. Yeah. So, uh, so I produced, I produced um, like six files, had them on my website for free, downloaded, people downloaded a ton of them, and they said, you need to start selling these, and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Maybe I should. And now I'm, I don't know, over 500 sounds. Yep. And some of the best I've heard. And yeah. what I like, what I like about your sounds is you've got it all the way down to non-aggressive, to aggressive. You're hitting almost every single animal that can be. You know, um, one of the things that we joke about and laugh about a few years ago called in a cow to guinea pig distress. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got stuff that a lot of people don't even think about or even would use. Scream. But that, but intrigue that cow and that cow. Screaming monkey. Yeah. Tomcat so. fight, you know? <laughs> that was cat. Yeah. I mean, and, and sounds are, you know, sounds are just a tool, you know? They're, they're ammunition for your caller. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't have too much ammo, mm -hmm. especially if you can organize it. Um, and you never know, I mean, just like what we've been experiencing this week, um, situations, you can't just go by the same recipe every day because animals change daily. Yeah. Or throughout the day. So I like having a lot in my arsenal. You know, if I notice a coyote coming in and, and uh, he's a little standoffish, standoffish, I'm playing something too aggressive, then I'll back it down to a sound that I know is that has the same pitch and cadence, um, but not as aggressive. And then you'll see them turn on. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that was, that was one of the things that we were talking about as far as tactics <clears throat> and stuff. And we, we you know, out in the truck, we're always talking. I mean, I'm very inquisitive. I like to learn. I like to listen. And, and that's kind of one of the things that we did for this, for people that, you know, want to learn more. They want to be more of a, you know, successful predator hunter, whether that, you know, whatever kind of predator they're hunting. Mm -hmm. 
and um, like you said, switching up sounds. You know, what do you think in your mind? What do you think is a makes a successful predator hunter, or what do you think that they somebody can do to become a successful predator hunter? Ooh, that's a tough question. Things that a person can do is one. Don't forget the tactics you learned to get to that point of being a predator hunter. Everything I've learned about hunting, be it I'm hunting, you know, coyotes, bobcat, fox, elk, deer, doves, doesn't matter. I learned when I was a kid hunting squirrels. You know, you learn woodsmanship. There's a lot of people who have zero woodsmanship. Mm -hmm. You know, woodsmanship, stealth, um, firearm safety. I mean. Don't forget about all those things because those are all just building blocks. Um, <clears throat> for a person to say, I've never hunted anything and I want to be a predator hunter, that's a pretty big hill to climb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A really big hill to climb. You're talking about going against apex predator as a human, going against apex predator as a coyote. Um, that's no short order. Once you've come to that point, like you said, one of my biggest things would be homework. Mm -hmm. Do your homework. Mm -hmm. Go out and do your locations. Like yep. we, what we've done, you know, we, I know we both like to do that. We've talked about me and Cody does that back home. Um, you know, I used to work a 12 hour shift and in that 12 hour shift on the way home at 5 a.m. I'm stopping on a lot of spots and just going down the road and I'm howling, trying to get responses. I nope. know where I'm pinpointing where they're at. No and different that, than a turkey hunter would trying to shock gobbles. Yep. The night turkeys. before yep. he's, he's, he's locating them. He's trying to get them to gobble. That way he knows where to go the next morning. Yep. Predator hunting on that part to me is, is no different. No. You want to do your homework. Yep. And, and. And that leads into lots of things. One, you may be hunting and you want to know where the cows are so you know which way to approach that section of land or that creek bottom. Um, but then also, um, it's a huge scouting tool. If you consistently three nights in a row or three times in a, in a month hear a group of coyotes in a, in a block of timber, that's probably the person you need to go knock on the door and ask for permission. Yep, yep. You know? And, that's, and I say that's one of the things that we... We have, like I have almost 500 farms to hunt on. Oh, wow. Right, because I'm, I'm, I have to go knock on doors. Uh, mine's a little different. Same with, with, same with Cody. You know, it's private farms. In Missouri, we don't have huge lots of public land, mm -hmm. you know, like you do or like a lot of these other people do. And I know you hunt different ways, not just all private land or public land and private too, but you've got to go knock on those doors. Well, that's a perfect opportunity. You stop down through there where I think this looks good, stop on the road, get off the road, make sure you're safe, but then start howling. If you get it, go knock on that door. Well, mm -hmm. there's another one. And you know, something I like to use is, and we use is Onyx Hunt. You know, whatever app you want to use, okay, boom. Or if you see potential, mark it somehow. I want to go back to that one. But my point to that is I would say, you know, it comes to you doing your homework and then what do you do after your homework? You got to rotate those spots. And I think where a lot of people, and I hear a lot of people, they, they call that same spot over and over. Well, you know, now I got these coyotes where I used to do this and now they won't do that. And uh, man, when I first started, they're great. Now I can't get through anything. Well, then you start talking to them. Well, how many times do you hit it a year? Mm -hmm. How many times do you hit it every, you know, how many months do you wait? Weeks or, you know, and you hear these guys, well, I just hit it two weeks ago. Or if you're sitting in the same spot, like you don't want to set up underneath the same tree because this block yeah. of timber looks good and you've killed multiple right. coyotes, by whatever. You can't sit in that same spot every single time and expect success every time. Yeah, I mean, I mean especially you, if it, especially if the coyotes experience something negative happening. While that, I heard that rabbit sound or just right. a squealing rabbit in general. Um, there was a big old boom sound. Yeah. You know, they'll remember that for a very very. Especially long time. if you have multiple come in and only you kill one <laughs> and two or three get away, they're they're going to remember that. They're going to be like, oh, heck, you know, Steve didn't come back with us. He's, where's he at? You know, so those other two, they were pretty much educated. So you're going to have to set up a completely different strategy to get. Agree. But, you know, my best luck has always been when I first pick up a new property and I'll go call it. You know, I'll say, hey, you know, do you mind if I call coyotes? And they say, oh, yeah, have fun. You know, um, when do you want to do it? And I'm like, right now? Boom. Okay, good luck. And, uh. And I'll go back and I'll call up a pair of coyotes and I'll kill them. And then I'll come back and show them, and the, you know, the farm, the farmer and his wife, and they're like, "Holy crap, you don't mess around." Yeah. But the next trip, I may call blank. And next trip, I may call blank. I mean, um, and the reason behind that is, 
what you may kill is, let's say, a five-year-old coyote. You killed the most aggressive one in the, mm -hmm. in the place. It may take five years to get another big aggressive mm -hmm. one in there. Mm -hmm. um, rotate your property, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Don't call it every weekend. I have lots of places that I only call once a year. Right. It yeah. really depends on if that's a honey hole or it's one that, oh, it produces every now and then. And then you got to find out, are they, are those coyotes staying there or are they just moving through that location? Right. Exactly. So yeah. like back in Missouri, you know, we have farms. You know, it may be a 100-acre farm, maybe a 50. It may be a 1,000-acre farm. So you got to determine, are those coyotes just moving through or is this a spot that they actually stay? And then that's where you determine, I think, how far or how often you go to that spot. Agreed. And happy some spots you can call more than others. Happy hunting grounds will fill in if you kill off all the coyotes. Within two weeks, if you got a good population, within two weeks, there's going to be new coyotes there. Mm -hmm. Because there's something in that that's holding them. that spot that is holding those. Agreed. So you take one out, another one will take its spot right, from, right. from the neighboring, you know, or you've got, or you've got a group that you've got a young coyote, you know, that, that is, is trying to make his way. They've been dispersed. Well, he's got to, he's got to find a place to go. And if you've killed that dominant coyote, well, he may or may not take it, or there may be another one that's a little more dominant that yeah, now you don't get a chance. Him out a smaller piece of it. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So it's going to be a, t t and that rotation, whenever you take out that dominant one, that rotation is only better for you because then all kinds of things start going into effect. You got, you know, you got the females trying to find the males. You got a new male trying to take over and be dominant, and he's trying to find him a spot. And a lot of things happen, and I find that that becomes pretty good for the predator hunter mm -hmm. when that rotation starts happening. Do you do agree on that? I mean, uh, it, can, I it can make and some I good think changes. There's another, there's another rotation is right during breeding season. Right. You know, I had always in my head for 40 years thought um, the males run out all the other coyotes. Mm -mm, it's a female. Mm -hmm. You know, by raising my coyotes, um, when, a, when a female comes in the heat, holy moly, she will try to kill every female around her. And get rid of her and get her like she wants that competition gone um you, you cash in on that you know mm -hmm. um those coyote fights happen on a daily basis you know testing boundaries testing territories taking over new territories um or running people out of your territories um that's why i'm a big fan of using coyote fights <laughs> mm -hmm. it's always worked for us i mean mm -hmm. that's one thing i noticed in your library you use a lot of different kind of you know coyote fights or disputes or you know anything like that then man you just hit hit those up just constantly change them and then you'll see you'll get into a streak where man that's all that you get them to respond to it's some kind of fight or you know domestic dispute as well yeah. we'll call it you know you get that and they man they just won't respond to rabbits and all of a sudden they let go yeah they're back on rabbits you know well, or like, they're back on something else well like today you know we went calling this morning we went out we located three groups mm -hmm. um put together a game plan that we're going to hit those three groups and then if we see some good stands in between, we'll do those as well. Um, we slipped in, got the wind right, got the sun right. Um, we just howled at this group just, I don't know, half an hour before. Start out with rabbit, worked our way all the way up through fights, did some howling. They howled back again, they're still in the same spot. They just weren't interested in anything. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of different things can affect that, right? I mean, like today, the winds, the wind was high. It was something in the atmosphere. We could tell something was different. It, today felt different. Yeah, um, you said there was a storm. We even got started. There was a storm morning. coming. The barometric pressure was dropping, and animals went into hunker down mode. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you go in and you go into a property, you call, and you just don't call anything. If you slip out as as quiet as you slipped in, you can go back to that place tomorrow if you wanted to. It's no harm, no foul, you know. When you start shooting or you start <laughs> yelling at your buddy and slapping on the back and, hey, let's go check the tree stand while we're here and all that kind of stuff, you know, then you need yeah. to give a place of breathing room. But if they're not turned on, they're not coming. Yeah, and it don't matter what you do. Mm -hmm. And you, you, we've talked about throwing or, every... or maybe even four hours from now, boom, then they're turned on. Yeah, because you were talking about, I, I want to go over that too, Tony, because you were talking about a cycle, mm -hmm. a rotation. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, animal movement in general um, just has just goes in in uh, in patterns. Uh, you've really noticed it. I start really noticing it uh, night calling all night long. Um, we'd be down in Texas and what have you, and you know, and any predator hunters that that spend the night predator uh, calling coyotes or fox, bobcat, it don't matter, coons. Um, there'll be a pattern. Uh, 
and it, you cannot set a clock by it as far as what works tonight ain't going to work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, you may, it may be right after sunset, those first two hours, the animals are moving like crazy, and then there's a lull for maybe an hour or maybe four or five hours, and then all of a sudden it picks back up again. And I think that cycle will ha happens throughout the day, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you may go out uh, and do a morning hunt and things just aren't moving and they're not responding and you're frustrated as heck. And, uh, but all of a sudden, like at noon, animals are moving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that you were in, you were in that, up, that, that valley of the peaks and valley of movement. Now I've kind of noticed that too with, with like, you know, we're fairly new to night hunting because in Missouri, we just, that law just got passed a couple Two, years ago. Yeah. yeah, so we're just started to be able to get to night hunt. So we're definitely not experts at that by any means. So I've noticed though, that when we're out or, you know, we're out by ourselves or together, whatever, that it was like, we would be out calling, out calling, and then a certain time, mm -hmm. boom. I mean, you're like, you're throwing everything out of them. You can see, you know, you're seeing them, you know, they're out there, they're, they're howling and barking at you, but they will not come in. And then all of a sudden we'd hit that peak, like yeah. it was midnight, like, one yeah. o'clock, something like, yep. something like that. And then boom, man, we were just covered. I mean, they're just, you know, so I, I kind of see what you're you're talking mm -hmm. about. And then fishing goes the same way. Yep. You know, I sat, I sat, uh, you know, at a lake, at a boat ramp with chicken liver on a hook from sunset until midnight. At midnight, from midnight to 1230, boom. You got four rods in the water, all four are going off. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may last for half an hour and then quiet again. So we're, okay, so one of the biggest things I, you know, I see in, in predator hunting world and, I, and on all the pages and groups and stuff, they talk about the moon phase. Mm -hmm. You would be more experienced on that than us because we haven't done a whole lot of night hunting. You hear some guys say, oh man, I, I do great in a full moon. You just got to be <laughs> careful where you set up. And then you hear some guys say, now nah, full moon, I stay home. You know, you want it under this amount of crest and under. What, what's your experiences and what do you think about that? Um, when I lived in Iowa, the only way you could night hunt was without lights. Mm -hmm. So you had to catch it, snow on the ground, full moon so you can see, and no wind. Well, that happened like two nights out of the whole year. <laughs> and by golly, you better been out. Mm -hmm. And you're going in sick tomorrow because you're going to call all night long. And I want to clarify, that's the way Missouri was. We could do moonlight, moonlight only. only. So when I say two years ago, right. artificial lights, night vision, thermal. Okay. okay. So um, any kind of system. Like which, is kind of, which is actually really fun hunting that way because when you lose your vision, or it's very, very limited, mm -hmm. your hearing gets so much better. Mm -hmm. You can hear, you know, and you're like, I hear a coyote coming. You start scanning, you're looking through your scope. And heck, he's like 200 yards away, but you can hear it <laughs> come through that snow. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was a pretty good advocate of, I hate the full moon. Hate it. Um, and I, I had guys say, best nights I call. Sometimes I'd only go at night during a full moon. I don't know what they're doing different, but what I've seen growing up through high school and college and um, coon hunting with dogs, full moon was a waste of time. Your dogs may strike one track all night long, but you may tree 25, 30 coons on a dark moon night. The coons aren't moving. Mm -hmm. I see that with predator hunting. Um, I see it with rat, the rabbits. On a, on a dark moon night, uh, a field may have uh, 500 rabbits in it, and on a full moon night, there may be like 8, 10. So why do you think that is? Do you think they don't feel safe, or do you think they are like, okay? I think it's something much bigger than that and that we can't explain because it could be cloudy out, and they still see the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, just how how does the moon affect tides? Heck if I know. Yeah. Yeah. It does, right? right. It, it has to do with, it has to do with um, magnetic polarity, or I mean, I don't know. It's right. beyond me. I just, you know, how can I use this as a, as a hunter? I, I like a quarter moon. Quarterman, there's something about it. Um, I, I've got countless stories where the column, daytime calling, column's dead. We're not seeing much. We're not seeing much. You know, I'm on a, I'm on a hunting trip somewhere, and uh, they're just not moving. And all of a sudden, that quarter moon phase hits, and we weren't night hunting at all. Um, you're driving, and all of a sudden, wow, there's a dead deer. Oh, there's a dead coyote. Oh, well, look at there's a dead raccoon. Oh, there's another dead coyote. Hit on the road. Animals move that night. Mm -hmm. That day, the next morning, you're going to get in animals. Gotcha. And it just ironically every time is when it hits quarter moon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I like I like quarter moon, dark moon. I've planned you know for 
so many years uh, I planned all my hunting trips around it. Mm -hmm. And that's got, that's kind of what we did on this trip. We mm -hmm. kind of planned around the wind. We last two years we came in what September? September. And then this year we moved it back a little bit. And then when we planned this week, it was around the moon. So with that being said, we're, we haven't done any night hunting this year. So how does how do you think that affects you on a full night moon, or the moon the night before that night, the next morning? Because what we've realized, if we have a full moon night the night before that night, they don't strike until eleven or twelve. Mm -hmm. You got you're not going to do you, do you you're see, see a coyote until noon. Yep. yep, and I would say, based off of my memory. Um, I haven't written this down. That takes the fun out of it. Yeah. Um, uh, probably that's going to ring true 85% of the time yep. that you will not find a coyote until noon. Now, will you get some lucky ones? Sure. Mm -hmm. Because you're right there in their house. You're in their bedroom, right? I mean, you're getting that one that's kind of close. Or just like anybody else, just like humans or anything else, you got some that are just a little spunky, a little different. Maybe they didn't have a good night. Maybe, you know, something changed for that one one or two coyotes, right? And then right. they're going to go ahead and come on in. Every coyote's got the, for the majority. You're probably going to see that midday before they start yeah. getting active again. Yep, that's kind of the way we've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yep, afternoon hunts during a full moon may be phenomenal. You know, um, I've had good luck night calling on a full moon if you get it done before the moon comes up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like bam, call in a coyote. Next stand, bam, call in two cows. Next stand, bam, call in a coyote. And all of a sudden, that moon, you start seeing that orange. Beep, yep. flat that, line. That's happened that's, to us. That's happened time. to me several times. Yep. Yeah, it's like some, once that comes up, something changes. Something completely changes. Here's another moon story. We were calling in Texas. We started right at sunset. At 9 o'clock is when the sun was setting. And uh, first five stands, we called five bobcats in 15 seconds or less. They were just on us. Boom. Shotgun only. We are killing them. Killed them all. Then we called blank stands the rest of the night. Until 4.30 in the morning, that moon set. And as soon as you see that moon disappear, we were in the middle of a stand, 30-minute stand, middle of it, calling with nothing happening, like all the mm -hmm. rest of the stands all night. As soon as that moon disappeared, coyotes started howling. I mean, like, 100 yards away. Wow. And then another group over here, another group over here. And then all of a sudden, we started getting coyotes in, and we called coyotes all Just the automatic. Time. They were just doing it on their own. Yep. We didn't do anything to trigger them how, you know, and I said, there's no way in heck they're, they're laying there watching that moon like, yeah. well, hurry up, hurry up. Yep. There's something, there's some kind of power to it. <laughs> Don't know what it is. Got a quick question from Jared, I think it's Boos or Bouse. Um, how much time do you guys spend at a set with no visual activity? That's a good question. Yours is different than mine. Yeah, I can tell you that. <laughs> it depends situation. Yeah. Yeah. You, and if you know the territory. Yeah. I mean. And it, for me, it depends on if it's my very last stand of the night or it's one that I'm working on, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So you want to start with. Yeah, it, it depends on how much depends on how much land you have access to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a fan of short stands. Uh, when I hunt the world competition, we do seven minute stands. And I feel that 80% of the coyotes are going to come in in the first seven minutes. 80% of those coyotes are going to come in within the first two minutes. So after the first two minutes, I'm already thinking about where my next stand is. Um, but I'm going to sit there for seven minutes. As soon as seven minutes is over, get up and gone. Um, that's, uh, tournament hunting is a lot like being in a bass fishing tournament with your partner versus taking your kids, you know, yeah. taking your kids on a pleasurable family fishing trip is totally different. You know, so... I'm not going to sit and run a gun and do seven minute stands. You wear your butt out mm -hmm. 30 stands in a day. Um, but so my average stand, 15 minutes. Um, back in Iowa, my buddy and I, we only had like six properties to call. Um, so we would do 35, 40 minute stands because if we did 10 minute stands, we would be back home by 8 a.m. <laughs> So it yeah. depends on how much property you have. Right. If you're in a place that's got um, a high cod population and you could just run and gun, and that's what you want to do, just do 10 minute stands or gut feel it. Um, we'll pull up to a place and like, it's the end of a road or something, right? You're like, you know what, let's, we're 10 minutes, that's all we're going to get, you know? We did that. We did that yeah, yeah, yesterday. Yeah. Yep. Six minute stand, that's it. And that's just a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. 
And then that also depends on those short stands, what, what sounds you want to go to. If I'm going to go to a short stand, I'm going to hit maybe a couple howls. If I hit rabbit, it's going to be short, then I'm probably going to Den Raid. Or I'm going to, you know, didn't do, I'm going to something to try to, I mean, I, if I want it quick, I, I have confidence in the pup distress or the den raid or something like that. I have more confidence and that usually works on those shorter stands for me because I think it triggers something different, you know? And, uh, coyotes are reactive. Mm -hmm. um, they're reactive. If they're going to come, they're going to come. So you've got to find the right trigger. So don't, yeah, like you were saying, don't hesitate on burning through sounds. Yep. And they don't have to have any logic to them whatsoever, you know. Well, shoot, I played a cocktail, now a jackrabbit, now I'm playing a bird, now I'm doing a fight, and now I'm going to do a group howl. That doesn't happen. Yeah. You're in the same yeah. area in 15 minutes. But to minutes. them, it doesn't matter. It it's doesn't the matter. They don't it's, think like humans. And mm -hmm. if you once you start looking at it as don't think like a human, you know, I still find myself trying to tell that story. I'm a female coyote. I'm a male coyote. Mm -hmm. Or I'm a bigger male coyote. I got to fight. They don't mean jack crap. And I still catch myself doing that. Uh, oh, yeah. We all do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't mean nothing to them. And I can prove it. I mean, uh, I had a stand. I called coyotes. There was 11 coyotes on this stand in, in one wad, one group. And I had them for 45 minutes with me interacting because I forgot my gun at home. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just me two dogs and a video camera but for 45 minutes I played with them and I went from I would go from pup distress to rabbit distress and they would just run right to the collar and then after they wore themselves out and went and laid in the shade I'd go back to pup distress and they jumped to their feet like they never heard it before <laughs> and they come running with the same enthusiasm they did the other eight times um, because there was nothing negative happening to right. that you know if they would have smelt me by the way, remember that pup distress. Yeah. Um, I've got something to add to that, you know, and I, I get asked all the time, you do too, I'm sure you do too. Well, you play one sound, well, how, how long do you wait before you play another sound? I don't. I go right bang, 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 bang. Don't and, put the pause in there. But I, and I see people, well, I'm going to wait two and a half minutes because that's what that's what needs to happen. I'm like, no, bang, bang, bang. I mean, it's, And I used to be that way. I, I, I I'd play too, a sound, I'd wait a couple minutes, I'd play another sound, yep. wait a couple minutes. And as I've gotten more involved in predator hunting uh, longer and longer and longer and, and watch the experiences I, I become a more aggressive caller and then and then there again it takes your seven or ten minute stand to 15 to 20 minute stand because you're you're pausing mm -hmm. just let it go just you know that's why i think your little sound packages of the 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 stun that stand sounds i mean that's that's phenomenal yeah especially yeah. for the beginning i put a, I, mean? I put some a lot of the sounds that has a little bit of a space in between them and I, and I did that kind of like when you're fishing. Um, you know, you plop your bait in, what have you, and you're reeling it back, and you don't get a bite, and you get ready to do it again. You kind of wait till all the ripples go away. Mm -hmm. So it has that, that shock factor. That's what, yeah. you know. So I've got, I mean, and it's not long. It's 30 seconds, 40 well, I was gonna seconds. Say, I mean, you, in, unless you are ready to hit pause and hit immediate play, every, there's always going to be a 30 second delay. I mean, almost always. But I'm talking like, Two minutes, three minutes. Yeah, yeah. and, you know and I know, yeah, and I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of uh, friends and and clients that are older gentlemen, and they like to, and I, I told them, you know, they said, you know, am I doing it wrong? I'm like, there's no wrong way or right way to, to call. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got their own style. Just do however you want to do. Right. You know. And then watch that. And anyone is, who criticizes say you're doing it wrong, the hell with them. Yeah. <laughs> you it's, know? It, every every. I mean, even you. For doing it for so many years every stand is still a learning process mm -hmm. i mean you still learn something almost every time you go out i well, mean i know i do and i haven't been doing it and you can tell you a different tactic too is on that set you know you i've seen you do it i may go to a place like yeah this one's a little different i see how they react here i do something you mm -hmm. know so you change up that sequence just a hair different you know and then one thing i noticed today too kind of going off subject one one thing i noticed today is you call your stand different according to if it's a face wind mm -hmm. or a crosswind because mm -hmm. i've seen you say well this is a crosswind i'm going to hand call first or i'm going to you know i've seen how you change that up would you can you want to explain your logic on that one and kind of explain sure, how you do that sure i mean <clears throat> i remember speaking at i don't know what it was some conference or something and they did like a a round table of predator guys and you know Describe your perfect stand. <laughs> Every person. It was like this, but times five. Mm -hmm. You know, I want the wind in my face and the sun in my back. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I want the wind in my face. And, you know, How often does that really happen? And it, was, and it yeah. started getting mundane because everybody was saying the same damn thing. Um, I said, I dare to be different. I want the sun on my back, but I want the wind in my back. And everybody's like, what? I'm a hand caller. Coyotes are going to, 80% of the time, they're going to go downwind of that sound source. Not because they're smart and say, well, is that a human or is that an electronic caller? No. Because places that's, you hunt, they've never even seen a human. Exactly. Right. A human. They don't do that. They go downwind because they're like a bird dog. You know, you know, like when you run bird dogs looking for quail, they're going to run on the downwind side of a railroad track and then cut in, mm -hmm. you know. Coyotes are the same way because that prey can stop squealing at any time. But once they got it with their nose, they've got it. Mm -hmm. They can. They know right where it's at. Exactly. So uh, when I hand call, I want to see downwind. You know, and I read years for people telling, you know, I call some coyotes, but I keep getting backdoored. I keep getting backdoored. I was like, the problem is you're watching the wrong door. Mm -hmm. You know, if 80% of the time somebody's coming in my back door of my house, I'm going to sit with a shotgun at that, <laughs> and at that back door. Um, that being said, electronic calls, I like to use a quarter wind. Mm -hmm. um, and preferably, you want to get the sun right and everything, preferably, I like to call her on my left, you know, because I'm a right-handed shooter, you know. Um, and I always tell guys, especially when there's a group of guys, you know, two or more, um, and when you go to sit down at a stand, always take the downwind side. Mm -hmm. You're going to get, all, you're the one that's going to get all the action. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. many times have we said that? Yeah. Come down here. Well, that's what me and we, Cody we do. We rotate who gets the downwind yeah, side. Every, you know? every stand and, is, all right, you have it, and the right, next stand I have it. You know, that's just... Yeah, you know, and, and we talked about that. I mean, coyotes make you liars. As soon as somebody says this is the way it is, they're they're full of shit because the coyote's going to make a liar out of you. We've had so many coyotes throw caution to the wind, run straight to the collar. We've seen it We've seen this one. week. They'll run straight to the collar. They don't give a crap about the wind direction. Mm -hmm. um, but they're they're the twenty percent. Mm -hmm. And the one we did see do that was a good mature coyote. It mm -hmm. wasn't a pup. So it wasn't like a young, dumb pup that's like, I don't care, which that, you know, that does play an effect because they're not as smart and they haven't had the, the knowledge or the uh, experience as the elder coyotes. But we've seen that today. Yeah, even, they even, ass look. Yes. <laughs> so we, predators. Yeah, because they come to the predator sound, well, there's another one there, well, you know, so. Um, but that one today, that one yesterday, it went right to the call and it wasn't a, it wasn't a small coyote, it wasn't. Mm. It, was, it was an older, a little bit older coyote. Maybe not an old big male, but it was a, a nice coyote. So that doesn't always play into effect. You know, and as a predator hunter, um, I, and I'm sure most guys are the same way, I get off on hard chargers, mm -hmm. you know. Um, hard chargers are fun, they're exhilarating, and if they stuff their face down inside the speaker, you feel like you've done everything that you've studied and did your homework and done this. Everything that mm -hmm. makes you a predator hunter, you've done your job and it worked. And at that point, I could care less if that coyote gets killed or not. Because hard chargers are also the hardest ones to kill. Because they are going to leave just as fast as they came in. Yeah. Well, we were talking about that today, like, because you were saying, well, they're going to be bedding down this spot because we had the high winds. And you said that. You said, if they do come in in the high winds, most of my high wind, ones I've called in high wind, they're in and out as fast as you can do it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so what you're saying is I need to point the gun at the call, or at the call and be ready to... To yeah. unload. Yeah, I mean, when it's windy, and it was like, what, 26 to 30 mm -hmm. mile per hour winds, I mean, one, you're wasting your time if you're trying to fight the wind. Don't shoot the collar upwind and try to fight it, because it's going to win every time. Mm -hmm. So in that case, sit on a crosswind, get the collar out there, shoot that sucker downwind. And that sound is going to travel for a long mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. And when they come, you know, most of them are not going to come. But when you do get one on the hook, he has got a beeline and he's going to mow that collar over. If it's up in a tree, he's going to jump up to get it. Um, that's one of them shotgun he stands. So a lot of guys talk about the wind and, you know, if we got a high wind back home, most of the, unless, like, like we, we're out hunting in the wind because we've drove a long ways to hunt. Yeah. So we, we've got a special trip. We're going to just keep trying it. We're going to pound it out. And we ended up what, quitting a little over half day today. But back home, we don't call at all. So like we were talking about earlier, it's like turkey hunting. You know, it's really hard to get those turkeys to come to you if there's a high wind. When they're walking sideways? The <laughs> when they're walking sideways, out. because there's so much movement. Now you get away with movement a little more, because if you move, everything, everything's moving. But they're not as comfortable. Being a prey animal. Being a prey <laughs> animal, they are gonna be most likely out in the middle of the field and they're gonna be where they can see 
and they're going to be on high alert. Well, coyotes are the same way mm -hmm. because they can't be cautious, as cautious, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. what you were saying today. And so they it's can't, just like yeah, it's like it messes turkey. with their senses. Their sense of smell's messed up. Their vision is totally based on movement. You know, they lose color. They can't see color, but by golly, they make up for it in peripheral vision and movement. Mm -hmm. And um, when everything's moving, that major sense is gone. Their nose is gone. That's their uh, number two sense. You know, yeah, um, and it's, then, take it, it's and taking everything away from them. Yeah, it's taking all their defenses away. Yeah, so you know what? I always said a coyote, a coyote um, has two things to do in life eat and survive, and he'll skip eating to survive. So, I guess we would go back on that time. I think I want to elaborate just a lot. Time on a stand, you're you're a, you're a shorter caller as far as time stands. I think that also, like you we said, it also goes back with land. We call 20 to 30, most likely 20 25. But I think that also depends on what you're calling too. If you're calling for bobcat, you're going to stay a lot longer. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be at the 45 minute mark because they're slower movers and they're more cautious. And and then you may you, that that bobcat may be there for 20 minutes. You never even see him until, he, until he pops up and moves. There's the right answer. Um, every every bobcat I've called in has showed up as fast, if not faster, than a coyote. You know, fortunately, I remember quite a few stands where you could hear them running. As soon as that caller starts calling, you know, as soon as you start calling, meow, meow, you, but you can hear them through mm -hmm. the leaf litter. Um, I think it takes guys 45 minutes to, to spot it because he finally flicked his ear or he turned his head. You mm -hmm. know, they can just, they're masters of deception. Yeah, and they can, sit, they can sit still. I mean, they got the most patience out there. They can sit still and you never, they blend right and in. And most you never predator know. hunters are cut out of the same mold. They have zero patience, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, a, it's the perfect perfect sport for people with ADD. Well, I'm guilty of going out and calling coyotes and I'm on a roll and I'm on a roll and then I'm like, okay, this is a good bobcat spot. I'm going to I'm going to change it up. I'm going to play my my bird distresses and my and my cottontail and I'm going to switch them back and forth. And I'm going to, you know, change my volumes. I'm like, I'm going to do all this and I'm going to get me a bobcat. And then I'm sitting there going, I know right down the road there's a really good spot. I know where the coyotes bed. I'm like, okay, I'm out of here. You know, I just I can't do it. I think that's where you know, I used to be a big deer hunter. And turkey hunter, I still like to turkey hunt, but when I got into predator hunting, that took a lot of that away. So it took away the patience for the bobcat. It really took away the, my patience for deer hunting. Big time. I'm ready to get out, and I like to be on that move, and which is good for getting the youth into hunting too, because you're not sitting there for four or five hours not seeing anything. Yeah, you're, you're constantly minutes. moving. Yeah. You know, we do a lot of coon hunting. Oh, we're, we're on stand five, six, seven minutes, ten minutes tops, so and we're on to the next one. Kids love it. You don't have to sit there for very long. Especially if it's cold, <laughs> yeah. you're moving on and you're warming back up and you're back in the truck. So yeah, the stuff you've done with coon hunting is amazing. The footage is amazing. Yeah, we got some good ones I can't, coming up. I can't oh, wait, wait to see. Just wait. I can't wait to see if you mix up your night calling with what you're doing during the day. It's that's gonna, gonna be, be fun. That's gonna be truck beds of, coy of uh, coons. Yeah. And like you said, it's a it's a great exciting sport, and nobody's hunting coons because the the fur price is down. So. Yep. The guys who had 50 hounds, you know, like me, I had 27 freaking coon hounds when I was a kid. Um, those days are gone. You can't afford to feed dogs because the, the, the bird price is worthless. Yep. So that just means from a predator caller's perspective, that's just more coons. Yeah. Yeah, and it's going to take the guys that just like the sport. You know, we don't, we, for us, I've noticed where, well, me and Cody just went out a month ago, mm -hmm. coon hunting or whatever. We called in the very first stand, called in a triple, and Cody shot all three, all three <laughs> coons. We were sitting up on a riverbank. Well, that's my turkey hunt spot, right? So if I can go out there and I can keep those those coons down, it's it's a double whammy. You're 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 enjoying the sport. You're helping the farmers because man, they can destroy some crops. They can destroy your turkey populations, quail populations. I mean, they're they're very destructive little animals, you know. So that really helps with the conservation side of it. Helps with the farmers, and then. Heck, we get to go out and have some fun. There's nothing, there is nothing, there is no value in them anymore. Missouri's even talked about, well, you know, this year we got a second, a second, second season. season. So we don't usually know, open up fur bear season until November 15th, mm -hmm. until January 30. 31st, yeah. right? So then this year they opened up one in August. Now it was different. There's leaves on the ground, there's leaves on the plant, you know, it's poison ivy. There's yeah. <laughs> bugs, there. so it's there's so everything. Rot. But me and me and Cody and, the, and some of our, my friends, we go out and we're still out there calling coons. Now it's a different kind of calling because you got to play a little different. In the winter, those coons are in the den trees. Den trees. During the summer, they're in brush piles. 
They're laying under stuff. They're laying up in a in a fork in the truck. I mean, they're they're in different places. Digging holes in the bottom. To yes. Stay cool in the dirt. Yeah. And what we did notice, they're not in the houses. That house is probably 100 and some degrees on the inside. It's hotter. Oh, that makes sense. They're not in the hay Whereas barns. Whereas in winter, we used to barn bust. Yep. Yep. You know, and kick open the doors with the spotlights. <laughs> you know, and send the terriers in and coons are running. And it was chaos. But see, during that early August, they're not going to be in those. Too it's hot, too hot. Man. That, I never even thought of that. So we did not notice any responses out of houses or barns or anything barns, that we nothing. normally. It was mostly brush piles and creek creek beds. Bob, creek beds. Yeah. yeah. Now where they're coming from, those creek beds, it's probably just, you know, laying up. You know, a lot of those root bars are under underneath there, and they're they're digging up underneath those and setting up underneath those in the shade. You know, where they're still getting. I mean, the they got water right there, and they got a bed right here. Plus, if there's water, there's tadpoles and yeah, frogs, everything they can want to eat. So. Or whatever. So. All right. So another. So I think we're going to move into the Q and A session here. Um, how many states has Tony hunted in from Shannon? I kept track of that. It was 19. I'm trying to think of since I keep quitting track, keep, quit keeping track of that. <laughs> if I've had, have I added any new states? No. I really slowed down on my travels. I used to save my vacation time when I worked like a real job at a real company, <laughs> um, I would save my vacation time and I would go on a hunting trip. You know, it could be Nebraska or Kansas or Oklahoma or Texas or, or Arizona or um, one, predator hunting's cheap. You don't have to apply for tags. Um, I remember lots of times, you know, in Southern Idaho, get the gas station and you're in camo and, and the girl says, that's working there. You're not from around here, are you? I said, no, I'm from Illinois. What are you hunting? Coyotes. You came all the way from Illinois to hunt coyotes? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Why? Why not? Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, they're so used to deer hunters, mm -hmm. or, you know, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, once I quit having a normal job and I spend time with coyotes and I hunt coyotes and I guide coyotes, I record coyotes. I don't necessarily travel to other states to hunt coyotes because I've got millions of coyotes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that that kind of brings up. Do you have another question, Chip? Oh, really? Okay, that kind of brings up something we discussed about, which I want to bring up. Your population of coyotes, probably per square mile, I would say, is probably more than ours. Would you agree, to Missouri? Yeah. Okay. So with that being said the tactics of locating them and the tactics of where they're going to be are going to be two two separate things uh, amen and so like back home we're going to find them in creek bottoms timber patches you know you're, you're we can go and say I, i'm going to say probably 75 percent chance they're right over here with that being said you can say well i know where they're going to come from most likely mm -hmm. they'll always prove you liars but most likely you can pinpoint that and then as you start hunting that spot you see, yeah, the last three times they've come from this course. So that's where we're able that's to... That's how you can say, okay, set up here. Almost every time they come right from there, they're going to come right, you know. That's how you can create predictability because yes. the trains help them dictate it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know, your valleys and your, your draws and your all that stuff, that's where they're going to move. They're going to stay hidden as far as they... As most of the time, they're going to stay hidden as far as they can get to the call or to the sound hidden. Until they have to get Until they head. have to get out of it. So that kind of predicts, now we go out, we locate, we do that, and then we do our homework. And then once we get in the groove of that landowner, because we're private, that landowner, then it, it becomes more successful. We can target. With you, you've got millions of acres to hunt, right? And, and a lot of open country. Yes. I prefer the open country, <laughs> luckily, because we got a ton of it. Um, I like the open country. In open country, they literally can come from wherever they hear it. So, you know, your sound in theory goes in a circle out from the speaker more one way or the other so let's say it's more egg shaped they could come from any of that any of those directions um, what's their target usually 50 yards downwind of where that sounds coming from um, but it always changes we there may be a pasture that let's say you know and you got to think in in the western states numbers are big you know we have one pasture that's just a piece of a ranch that was five sections, no fences. It's just one big pe uh, cattle pasture. Um, on any given day throughout the year, there's 
probably eight coyotes in five square miles. During calving season, hmm. that number goes astronomical. You know, um, my wife and I killed 186 in two months. Mm -hmm. um, we would kill six a day, or six a morning, every morning. You know, and then we'd go out in the afternoons too, you know. But um, it's just because there's a food source, there's mm -hmm. a draw. You know, and they're coming from who knows how far. Depends on which way the wind blew that mm -hmm. night. You know, they're like, oh, Something fresh meat. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so. There's the, the part of this is actually a question that somebody asked. Do you prefer hunting oh. in sand dunes or flat land? I like both. I like, I like, I prefer what's producing, producing animals. Um, Personally, when I go hunting for myself, which doesn't happen all that often, um, because I'm a committed guide, and if I kill a coyote, I feel like crap because that's a coyote that you could have killed yeah. or you could have killed. So um, when I, I do personal hunting, I go to public land. I leave my private guiding ranches alone. I go to pri uh, public land, and I take a shotgun because, personally, I want the ultimate challenge. I want to call in coyotes in this big, rough, mm -hmm. nasty terrain, and I need to get them in that little clearing right there, and I'm going to kill them with a shotgun. You know, one day I went out when I got a new shotgun, I wanted to pop a cherry on it, and I uh, went out and I killed two coyotes with it that morning. I could have killed six if I had my AR, but I was more than happy to kill mm -hmm. two with a shotgun. It's, it's a, I don't know if rewarding is the, the word, but it's a more... It it's a challenge. Yeah, it, it's a challenge, and... Like you said, well, man, I, that one shotgun kill was kind of more exciting than four more with the AR or I, with I a, will take, a gun. Or, I will well, take one with a shotgun over ten with a rifle. You've accomplished more. Mm -hmm. And there's guys out there that that's all they do, man. They just shotgun hunt. They're great at it. Um, there's competition hunters, you know, that hunt in the big competitions like the World Championship. And they're a shotgunner, and that's what they use. Yeah. You know, and hats off to them that they just killed, you know, you know, 15 coyotes, all with shotgun. What what could they have done with a gun? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. well, how many could they kill? So with a rifle, yeah. But that's that goes back to, you know. You see a lot of, <laughs> uh, pecker contests mm -hmm. in the predator hunting world, which drives me absolutely nuts. Oh yeah, just nuts. spend five minutes on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if you notice, like you, we stay out of it. We, we 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 try to just do our own thing. You know, we hope that people enjoy what we produce, and we hope people like what we do but you know we stay out of all that but with that being said is everybody what makes a person a successful hunter this guy that's killing a hundred coyotes over here he's killed a hundred and six months or whatever you know it's just throw out some numbers and this guy here has killed 20. how much time does this guy have to hunt mm -hmm. what is his job where he can do that where is his his land and what what you know there's so many factors into why that guy killed a hundred and this guy killed 20. This guy may have an 80% stand rate. He may be able to go out and 80% of the time he's killing a coyote. Yeah. But this guy has been doing it for six months. His rate's 50%. But it looks different. And then everybody gets in this big war. Oh my gosh, I'm going to do that again. Everybody gets in this big war. and It's it's all on them, the number. You got also look at it from a eastern hunter versus a western hunter. That's a big right? debate, right? That's a big so, debate. So you got, let's, let's I'll pick, I'm going to just pick in Texas just because I feel like it. You got some Texas night callers that'll lay down 50 coyotes. This is what we killed this weekend. Then you got, um, and this is before thermal scopes kind of bastardized predator hunting. You know, you now have guys, you know, hey, we killed these freaking 18 coyotes in Ohio. Dude, you killed seven all year during mm -hmm. the day, you know, yeah. um, before thermal was allowed around. So you take that guy in Ohio who killed seven seven coyotes all year he's a better hunter than those boys in texas to lake 50 down and i can say that i you know i take a lot of clients um when jd pyatt came down um it impressed me that he, that he had the discipline he was a good hunter i always said if you take an east coast or eastern hunter and they use those tactics that's how i became successful and i didn't read there's no damn manual you know on how to go to 19 states and call coyotes but if you take the tactics that you learn growing up in the Midwest and apply them to the West, you're going to be a bad dude when it comes to anything. Well, you, you, you want to go, you wanna go, you wanna go pronghorn hunting, you want to go mule deer hunting, 
elk hunting, you use those whitetail tactics you learn, you will be successful. I guarantee you. Yeah, we you hunted know, with JD. Hunting. We hunted with JD a couple times, and and it was fun to watch him. And and JD's calling sequences and the way he did things were very very similar to ours. But there was a couple of things that he did, and I'm like, okay, yeah. I had to you teach know, him. There was a few things. That was I had to teach like, him volume. Hey, we're calling coyotes from a mile and a half away. Crank that shit up. Yeah. <laughs> so that actually brings me into another question. Um, you know, call sequence tips here uh, from Trenton Cotswar. Um, what do you do to the volume once you see a coyote coming in? I do not adjust. Don't change it. There's a Why lot would of, you? Yeah, there's a lot of videos. Uh, and DVDs that would say, you know, bring the volume down, you know, make them hunt for the sound. Coyotes like consistency. Um, cattle are the same way. Um, if something's different or something's changing, they don't like that. Yeah, they sure. like they like consistency. Um, if they're they're focused on coming on, let's say let's say rabbit distress, don't change the volume. They'll stuff their face in that collar full blast. Because. I I've hunted, not to interrupt you, but no, I've hunted with guys and they're, they're like, you know, they're, Kyle's coming up, turn that down, turn that up, you know, like, why? They're coming. Why would that's you change what, that's anything? That's the noise, that's the level, and I'll tell you what, when we first started hunting, that's how I was four or five I just years ago. Him. Bring it down. I just ignored him. Yeah. <laughs> I was I'm like, like no. turn it down, turn it down, turn it He's like, nope. <laughs> and you know, his exact words were, that's the level, that's the sound that brought him from 100 yards or yeah, 300 yards nothing. to 50 you know i mean it's so I, i've had i've had you know the collar up in up in the tree you know in some areas you know that was a good way to get it up so i put it up on the limb that's head high mm -hmm. and plain didn't rate this is a good example and i had you know coyotes starting out and then i was getting them interested they were they were making their circle through the timber and stuff and i had them i could see them here and there i hit den raid and i had it cranked i mean this is on the outlaw and i had it cranked mm. That 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 big male coyote come running in, and he was literally had his nose right here barking and growling at that. Okay, so you got two factors. You got the level super high, and what the heck is a coyote doing up in a tree in a limb, right? Mm -hmm. That's not normal. But you're overloading his sensories. But he is look yes, he's looking into that call with that call right here. I mean, he was mad, and, you know. So you're bringing out like you said, it's it's reaction. Mm -hmm. Now volume level. I, I've gotten more aggressive with my volume level too. Even back in Missouri, when it's not so open like you are here, where it's going to echo in the woods. Where it's going to echo in the woods. And I think, in my experience, if I'm if I'm calling near timber or in the timber, which I don't do a ton of it because we got open fields, but I I I tend to take that volume level down just a little bit Me and too. work my way up. Me too. Okay, but if I start in a big old huge wide open field, I'm not as cautious about it because i can see what's around me close right and then i know i'm trying to pull them from that piece of timber over there a quarter mile away or you know what i mean so then i i start out at like that five or six level on, on the on the outlaw right and then i work my way up and then i i don't i'm not scared to go full blast nine ten i run level nine i'm a level nine caller i start out my stands on level nine um and that that comes from seeing what works mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as going on a lot of recoveries you know that remote range on the on the outlaw of the night stalker is crazy unbelievable we advertise it for 300 yards i did it at 750. it goes beyond um and what's nice is when you're going out and recovering a coyote that somebody gut shot and you get up to them and they get up and take off running again or what have you and you're now all of a sudden you're getting kind of far from where your all your mm -hmm. gear is um I'll press play on that and then head to that thing. Yeah. Um, so typically, you know, we're going to get, we're going to go pick up the coyote within two, three hundred yards. I'll press play, and uh, I'm see. I, I'll show my client or what have you. See, it doesn't. It ain't that loud. Level nine, jackrabbit distress, and it sounds to me just right. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so then you think a coyote's hearing mm -hmm. a million times better than ours. You know, they're they're hearing it out so many so many feet but it's not like you said it's not blowing their eardrums out it's 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 not down quite a bit like yeah, you said, I don't you're hearing know, it less i don't even know if their hearing is all that much better than ours they're better at pinpointing where the sound is because they got that whole movement we can't move our ears <laughs> kind of cool if you did yeah um but tons of stories about that where you're when i'm hand calling where 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 here comes a coyote okay let's just go quiet that sucker will come right to that bush and he mm -hmm. ran through stuff that was this deep but he knew exactly where that sound was it's unbelievable now when we, we spoke about jd pyatt 
um, when he was hunting with us a few years ago, we came in and we had a coyote out 350, 400 yards. And we were watching this coyote come across there. We, we'd called him into this open field. We were, we were hunting a, a cut crop field, so it was really low. It was, you know, winter time. I, I can't remember if it was December, January, whatever. We saw, this, we saw this coyote out there, and he was at least 350, 400. Maybe more, but I'm, I'm going to go with that. And we started lip squeaking. And that coyote parked up his head, mm -hmm. 350 yards, just a normal lip squeak, and he, boom, here he comes. And then JD kind of started going into some really light calls, but I mean, it was so quiet, and he heard you. I don't know if I could do that. You know yeah. what I mean? I couldn't hear that. So it makes you wonder how that hearing is. Yeah, how good it is. So if you start out your volume, that goes back to if you start out your volume really loud, and you're 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 a, a, a hunter like what landscape that we have, are you going to scare those coyotes off when you start out really loud? Well, I mean, if they're bedded down right there and it's really loud, I mean, yeah, you're gonna blow them out. They're they're gonna hop up and take off. Yeah, yeah. It don't matter what side but, it is. If even if it's one they're want, attracted to, at least to. in our territory, you that's, that, you, that's but what you, you do want, want that shock factor. Yeah, you know, um, I've caught so many rabbits. My wife was with me when we caught them. They don't start out like quiet and work up. They are loud and work down. You know, so when you first catch a rabbit, it is piercing loud. Bang! You know, and yeah. as a as a producer, I want to catch that. You know, so I already got the recording equipment going. You know, I want to catch you because you can't duplicate that. Mm -hmm. um, there is, it doesn't start out soft and work its way up whatsoever. But I know what you're saying about yeah. you don't want to blow out what may be um, within a hundred yards. Right. Um, if you're good and stealthy, walking in, there's, there's a chance cars could be within a hundred yards. Happened a lot to us. <laughs> That's that woodsmanship. Yeah. There's a lot of guys that, you know what, don't worry about it because you done scared everything within a quarter mile out. You know, of slamming the door and kicking the soda cans and, yeah. <laughs> and bullshitting with your buddy and, and shooting a rabbit on the way in. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that I, I, I've tried to discipline myself on is, and, I, and I've kind of, uh, Cody's witnessed this, when I go in to hunt, when I'm relieving, I do the same thing. Oh, that's just as important. Just as important because what if that coyote's sitting out there at, you know, 7,500 yards, you don't see him, but he's listening to everything that you're doing. So he just heard all these sounds, boom, 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 and then you get up like, ah, blah, blah, you know, and you're talking and having a good time. I try to slip in just, or slip out just as quiet as I did in. Is that that's you what I, yeah, yeah, that's what I do when I go to the neighbor lady's house. I slip out just as quiet as I slipped in. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that's being, very important. That, that's that's that just setting said, yourself up for your next that stand. That being said is not every coyote comes to the call. That's why you may hear a group of um, 50 coyotes, which turns out to be five coyotes, hmm. and you call to them and only one of the five came. There's four others that are still sitting back and hearing and seeing and everything. Um, so just because you didn't call in anything doesn't mean they're not, they're not, they don't know you're there. Which goes kind of different, but kind of the same, which goes with every, you will never, all coyotes will not answer you back when you howl. You may, you'll, you will have some that will sit there and they may be 200 yards, but they did not answer you. So whenever you go to set off, a, you know, we like to, we, we do like you, we'd like to set off our stand, start our stand off with a howl, mm -hmm. locating howl, or just to say, hey, I'm over here, mm -hmm. you know, where are you guys at? And that's what they're doing. That they're, they're setting their territories when they're howling, right? I mean, they're saying, well, I'm here, you're over there. And they're kind of saying, well, you know, okay, have, have respect. You stay there. Don't come to my area, but hey, I see you. Right. So with that being said, when, when it comes down to that, a coyote will still, don't rely that there's no coyotes there just because the one did yeah. not respond to you. Yeah. I, I always say, like locating, we're talking about locating. Locating and calling have nothing to do with each other, right. except for building your confidence, confirming that there's coyotes in that area, um, and sometimes they come in, you know, yeah. if you're, you want to do it from a distance because they're, they're, they're going to come in quiet. Mm -hmm. um, just because they're howling doesn't mean that they're coming and just because coyotes are coming may they may or may not howl yeah you know so you can't really you can't really dictate your stand no, on no, that and don't all. judge it don't no. judge it like man the coyotes were howling but they didn't come in what did i do wrong you didn't do a damn thing wrong they just weren't going to come in mm -hmm. you, you got know? some people that talk all the time and won't shut up and some people that are very quiet and once you get them talking a little bit here and there but we had that group this morning that howled like you said we located them and then when we went to set up, we got them going again. They were in the same spot. They had no interest. Because there's other factors. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I, when I hear one, I always feel my confidence gets built up. But <laughs> then when one reacts, I'm like, okay, here we go. That's like going in the woods and you got a turkey goblin up in a tree. You're feeling pretty damn confident. Mm -hmm. You're going to try to get on that bird. You're setting up on him, and then he goes on the other side of the river. <laughs> <laughs> in the other field. That's what he was going to do anyway before yes. you ever came. Exactly. Yep. All right, so kind of a loaded question here, I think. Oh, um, great. From Tyron Fields, what's the most dogs you've shot on a single stand in New Mexico, and what call did you use? One, I've never shot a dog on a stand ever in my life. I've raised decoy dogs. I don't shoot dogs. I shoot coyotes. I shoot coyotes. But I don't shoot dogs. Go on. All right, um, so how many coyotes? How many coyotes? Me or my clients? I don't shoot. I don't. I don't. I, I think this is just kind of a general question for you in New Mexico. What is the most that you've shot on, on one a stand? stand? On one stand? On a single stand. Answer both. Uh, we call one. Um, I did this. I filmed it with my phone. I shared it on Facebook. Um, we called 16 coyotes, and my clients killed six of them. Six on the most. Six on one stand was the most. Um, the most coyotes we called in a day was 31, um, with a couple of buddies of mine that come every year. Um, the long time standing for over 10 years was 28, was my record. They broke it with 31, and then the next year they tied it again with 31, and that was all shotgun hunting. That was fun. Um, the most coyotes we've killed in a day? 29 at night, and I don't remember how many in the day. It was probably close to that. I mean, I remember quite a few 17, 18-day coyotes. And then awesome to tell you on a shitty day of calling, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> on a three, on a, typically, I mean, you're here in October, right? Typically, on a good, normal year, um, we'll call 50 to 60 coyotes in a three-day hunt. Like and I've got long track history with clients that have been Merino and them uh, coming here for what, 10 years? Mm -hmm. And that's their average. That's what they judge this year is based off of, you know, let's try to call 65 this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the things, too. It's like we plan this out a year in advance, you know. Last year when we were here out with you, okay, let's get on the day, let's look at the moon, let's, you know, when we planned out, you can't predict. No. You know, it's a great month, it should be good. We may leave and then two days later you may, you know, that's just part of it. Oh, that's it. That, that being said, I've had a lot of three-day hunts where we've only called one coyote in three days, you know. Um, Tony Tubby doesn't post stories about that because that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but everyone's like that, you know. Uh, guys will post videos and, and of their good nights. But if they go out calling it, they're not going to post a story and say, hey, went out and had fun time with my buddy, you know, we had a good time chatting. Yeah, <laughs> made 15 stands, not as a single exactly. guy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, So Another question. Uh, Scott, uh, I don't know how to say his last name. Sainawa? Sainawa. Scott Sainawa. Uh, is it better to point the collar downwind or crosswind? Which way would you point the collar? The only time I point the collar downwind is because of extreme high winds, and I know that fighting the wind is is only re, is gonna be counterproductive. Um, I don't think sound it kind of does. I don't think sound just bends and like goes with the wind, you know. <laughs> um, but like if you hear a guy, you see a dude down the street um, hammering. If you're downwind of him, it sounds like he's like 50 feet from mm -hmm. you, you know. You're upwind with them, you can't even hear them. Yeah. Um, uh, crosswind. I like the predictability of a crosswind. I like to put my collar. If 80% if of the coyotes want to go to the downwind side of the collar, and the wind speed will dictate how far they want. Normally it's about 50 yards, 40 yards. Mm -hmm. If it's hardly any wind, it may be 5 yards, 10 yards. Um, if it's really windy, we see coyotes going 300 yards downwind. You know, and by having a remote, that'll work. And people are like, you don't set a call 100 yards from you. Bullshit. I've done it. Yep. When you've, when you've got boned the last five stands because yep. the coyotes are showing up, you know, 100 yards downwind, you put your collar up 100 mm -hmm. yards downwind. Because you, you're watching what's happening. You're, you're, you're seeing what's happening. You're going to change that tactic. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it, everybody's got their own style. That's my style. Um, I know my buddies up in Michigan, uh, they're, they're, regiment is 
to uh, call into the wind and then they're standing in the downwind cone of that collar because if that's where the coyotes want to be they want them to come right to them well what i've noticed is back in missouri we can going back to almost predicting where they're coming from mm -hmm. most of the time i'm like you i like a crosswind if i set that if i set that call and depends on how far out you want to go to depending on your ter on your terrain but if i set that call 50 75 yards upwind where's that coyote going to be <laughs> right there you, you can put that coyote almost anywhere you want to be amen you know so i like the crosswind now if i if i go with a the wind in my face that only works if I know exactly what's behind me and I know they're not going to get behind me. Like a river. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a river or something like that. Now, you may get one off the next property, but that's most likely probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, now, going with the call going away from you, out into a field. I don't tell very many people I do it very much because I don't want that to become a norm and people to pick up and say, well, that's what you should do because everybody's professionals and they will tear you apart. But I know my spot, I know what's gonna happen and I know where those coyotes most likely are gonna come from. And that's gonna be a huge open field where I know they can't get to that downwind side. So you can play that very well, but it's gotta be the right yeah, spot. You can play, you can play a predator like a, like a fiddle. Um, what I always looked at, guys are like, you know, cause I have people come here for educational hunts and I'll teach them how to set up a stand. That's probably the most important part of what we do. University. Um, exactly right. Um, and I said, you know, picking out a stand's easy. It takes me three seconds. You know, I'm already not only have the stand figured out while I'm walking to it, I already seen the stand while I was driving into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, I look at it. I don't know what other, everyone else does. This is how I've always done it. Is you look at, um, I look at it as a stage or like a play. Um, where do you want to kill a coyote? I want to kill them there. Nice big open spot right there. You know, and there's no bushes in my way. Okay, I want to kill them there. How are you going to get them there? How are you going to get them in the middle? Well, the wind's blowing left to right, so I'm going to put the collar on the left. And, you know, and all this shit goes through yeah. your head, it, like, instantaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and probably about 40 yards. He's probably going to go about 40 yards. Boom. So that's how I can predict, like you were saying, you know, I used to be really good, especially when I was hand calling, of telling clients, move your gun to the left. Why? Because the coyote's going to show up and he goes yeah. right there. You know? Yeah, as time goes on, you, you kind of get to know where you're going to point that gun. You know most of the time they're going to be in this zone, this pie zone. They're going to be mm -hmm. there most of the time. If they come in from a different direction, okay, it happens. But most of the but time they're going to... But how rewarding is it when you call up a coyote and all you do is just roll into your gun? <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> well, today I made a joke. I'm like, Tony, I'm getting a little lazy. Just, just put them right down the end of my barrel if you don't mind. <laughs> Three of them would be great. We were, it was just getting worn out, we were tired, you know, I was just, so I was making a yeah. joke, but it, it gets to the point where it's not that serious and it does happen, but you at least got them in the right area and, and you don't have to make as much movement. And, and if you get to a point where you really, truly love calling predators, you know, like I just, I got that little euphoria or whatever when I was talking about, when you roll down into your gun and I mean, that's a huge reward to you. Mm -hmm. I could care less if that coyote dies or not. If it gets missed, I mean, I got so many guys like, oh, man, dude, I'm so sorry I missed that coyote. I could give two shits if you shoot that, shot that coyote. <laughs> we succeeded. We called in a coyote. He came exactly where we figured he would, and he was in your crosshairs. I mean, yeah. what's missing is just a hero picture, you know? Yeah, yeah. But if you truly love the art of predator calling, it's all about getting those animals to be where you want them to be. So we would both agree a crosswind is our favorite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Definitely. All right, another question from Mike Foltz. Um, what is the oddest sound you've used in a, to call a coyote on? I know that you guys had a story earlier, but Tony, what's... Well, what's when, I, well when I first started dating my wife... No, I'm just kidding. Um, the oddest sound... <laughs> the, outer, the oddest sound is probably uh, screaming monkey. Um, I can't, I produce uh, that sound, Screaming Monkey. Um, it's a buddy of mine down in Texas who had a pet monkey who was uh, in heat. And she was letting everybody know she's in heat. And uh, he sent me the video and I started laughing and I said, dude, like shut off all the background noise, shut the TV off and all that, and send me a good, clean recording of it. Um, and he did. 
Um, and it's one of those sounds, it's odd, it's weird. Um, and it's one of those sounds when nothing else is working, what the hell you got to lose? Right. You know? Um, you, you talked about using guinea pig. Yeah. Guinea would, pig, yeah. Scott say now that uh -huh. says that question in, he just wanted to record it. It's his daughter's guinea pig. Well, I wasn't the, I mean, it was, it was uh, Jason Haney and Paul Landsberger is the one that did the guinea pig, and it was, it's on video. It's actually in episode two, three, two, I don't know, but it was just boredom. It was like they've thrown everything out there, and and I think one made a joke and said, oh, watch this, guinea pig. There, there was a coyote, you know. So, me personally, my oddest would be, I don't, I don't go too odd. I, I, I've only tried to tried to get a big couple times. Because you take stuff serious. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes too much. Crybaby. I've used Crybaby. Yeah. I quit. I I got re uh, retired Crybaby. Crybaby was literally baby crying. Yep. Yes, JD sir. introduced us and, that and one years ago. It, does it work? Hell yeah. Does it feel kind of morbid? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say Squirrel. It's probably the, the one I've gotten. And I was targeting, um, I was actually targeting Bobcats. Um, I did bird. Part of their prey source, right? Yes, I did. I did bob. You know, I did bird and rabbit. And then I'm like, you know, bobcats kill a lot of squirrels, and uh, I did that, and a coyote came in. Nice. Um, one one interesting deal that happened to me a couple years ago. I got. It, I didn't get it on video as far as for an episode, but den raid. I had a bobcat charge the call to den raid. I mean, charge it like it was coming into a rat. I mean, it was. Let it was guess. different. It was a male. Actually, it was a female. Actually, really? it was a female. Big I say female. most most guys that contact me and say, "Dude, I killed this huge bobcat to den raid or screaming pup or something like that," and it, it's Tom. You know, mm. I don't, they plan on whooping some dog ass or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to think too. Are they thinking? Does does a bobcat know the difference between a pup and a and a full grown coyote? You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that that is probably the only coyotes. Besides other areas like wolves and stuff like that, probably one of the, in our area that's their only. You know, we don't have wolves really. Maybe northern Missouri, but that's probably one of their only other kind of predators that a coyote won't screw with. A bobcat can hold their own. I mean, we've seen those videos um, on the internet where a bobcat pulled down a full-grown mule deer or, yeah. mm -hmm. or a white-tailed deer, jump up and blast on the throat. You know. I wouldn't want to mess with a damn bobcat. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've seen it gnaw on my brother's leg, wrapped around and chewing on it. Mm -mm. So <laughs> I would say watch, okay, watch your cat and your dog at home. Do you ever see your dog get the best of your cat? Most likely not. One swipe across the nose, they're done, right? Now, now magnify that. I don't know. My dog said I think he shred a, coyote, <laughs> shred a cat pretty quick. But you take that and you magnify it against a bobcat that's got an extra, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different ball game. Yeah. I've watched, you know, deer carcass work. Kyle was eating on a deer carcass. We had this happen a few years ago. And we were going there to call. Didn't know the deer carcass was there. We walk in and we sit down and we're getting ready to start calling and we notice and we're like, well, there's a cow right there. All right, so we're getting ready to pull up and right before we get, you know, we we're going to take a freebie. The farmer needed to dig on. He was having problems with him. And the next thing we know, that cow starts acting weird and he starts doing his body, body language. And, you know, just like if you're calling, like, he don't like this. He's getting ready to bail. Bobcat walks up. The coyote leaves. He lets the bobcat have his meal. And then that coyote's just kind of sitting there watching. He stays back 25, 30 yards. Once that cat's done, he walks off and that coyote goes back over and gets his meal. <laughs> he bumped that coyote three or four times. The, coyote would, the, the, the cat would go back over, kind of settle down, I think, maybe a little food rest or whatever, then he'd go right back over. He bumped that coyote three or four That coyote would not want no part of that bobcat. So I would say that was probably their only, around our, our area, that's probably their only mm -hmm. other predator source. So... With the, going back to that, do you think that a bobcat would know the difference between a pup sound and a, and a coyote sound? So they come into that den raid because, and they're not scared of a full-grown coyote, I don't believe. But do they come into that even more charging because that's eh, just a pup? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Do, whooping their ass or eating them. Don't right. Know. Yeah. Because I've never seen that yeah. encounter where it gets to that far. But uh, Another question. Uh, what is your favorite hand call to use from Brandon Wright? <laughs> Brandon Wright is my best friend slash son-in-law. He's the first person I met when I came to New Mexico. And uh, I was going to the gas station. I was living out of the damn motel, guiding hunters, and trying to find land, find a house. Um, I just didn't know anybody, you know. And I met this young guy. He's a damn redneck. You know, <laughs> black truck, loud exhaust, camo on. 
And he looks That's at my kind of guy, yeah. <laughs> he's like, hey, what are you hunting? Coyotes. Boy, his ears perked up. You know, I like to kind of hunt, blah, 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 blah. So we got to talk. It was a Friday night, him and his girlfriend, and he's like, you want to come over and call, try to call Coyotes her, her parents' house? Sure. How much land she got? they got? 40 acres? Well, shit, I just spent all day picking up 40 section ranches, you know? 25,000 acres. All right, yeah, let's do it. So I followed him out there, and we went out, and uh, I, I, I called in a pair of coyotes. Boom, he shoots one. I keep hand calling, rah, rah, rah. called another pair of coyotes from across the highway. We'll watch them cross the highway <laughs> and come right in. Boom, he killed another one. We've been best friends ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and then he asked me to marry my daughter, and they've been married, I don't know, quite a while now. If I take you out on this couch stand, you can kill six, so, you can have permission. <laughs> the, my favorite hand call, he knows what it is. It's um, my orange call, my TT Extreme call, hands down. I know it like the back of my hand. I built it with my own two hands. Um, and, uh, and Brandon's pretty efficient on a hand call. I taught him how to hand call. Uh, Jared, uh, with the question, how important is scent control? 100%. Now, now is he talking... <laughs> Is he talking like um, you spray him, using talk, sprays and stuff? It. You talk about it. Is he talking about spraying and stuff? Well, just as how how important is how important is scent control? That is your number one. That's your number. That's one. your number one thing to cod hunting. That's that's what you base your whole hunts off of. But as right? far as the eliminators, I've never used them. No, we we did a few years ago, and I and I was under that impression like, um, you know, every little tip I can make. And, and my thought was, if that coyote somehow gets around you and comes in where it's not supposed to, and it gets your downwind side. He outsmarted you. He, yeah, <laughs> well that too. But I mean, it's like, I've noticed coyotes, if you, if you do spray down with something, maybe their reaction is, isn't as dramatic and they don't take off as fast. And I'm not saying that's going to happen every time. But it maybe will slow them down just enough for that, that shot. Get them to maybe double... To to double back. take a little bit. Now, if I don't use anything and it's all just 100% human scent and it's even stronger, they're going to bolt faster. I, I'm not saying that, and, and I don't use sprays anymore. I don't do that. I, you just play the wind. I like those hunter specialty wafers that they used to put <laughs> on their head. <laughs> Look like Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you play your stand right, you I don't, don't have do. To. I don't do any scent control. Um, I don't think there's any you way can't possible beat, you can. No. You can't beat their nose. And you, you know? can't eliminate 100% of it. No. Yeah. They, they smell something that isn't, that isn't right. You know, a coyote's a pessimist. Um, so they come running and then, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And they, they get smell of, <laughs> and it may not smell your downy, or it, but you, they smell that you broke a branch when you walked in, you know? Oh, uh -huh. something's wrong, I'm gone. You know, they're yeah. big sissies when it comes to that. Um, I don't use any scent control. The key is don't let them get downwind. Yeah. Don't let them get downwind, don't let them come across your track of where you're walking in, you got a coyote coming in, and he's he's working in and working in, and you'd really like to get him at the 150 yard mark, but he's at 250. If he's going to cross where you walked, you better stop and shoot yeah. him, because mm -hmm. he will. It's like he hit a brick wall. And pe and people don't. I think a lot of people don't understand that too. It's not, and it's a cone. It's mm -hmm. not a straight line. Mm -hmm. Once that wind hits that call or anywhere between you and that call, every bit of that is tainted. And it sticks to everything, you know. Yes. And, and once it goes out, it's it's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be. It's going to do this. It's going to dissipate, and it's going to go out all over the place. So you got to think, this small area actually becomes a very large area. Mm -hmm. So it that that goes dissipated as it goes. Yes. Yeah. So that goes back to where I was talking about earlier. Is like how far do you set that call out from you? Okay. So now we've already determined we're going to go upwind with that call, but how far out do you go? That determines your spot. Mm -hmm. Right. Some calls I may go out 75 yards this way, 50 yards this way, and then I'm up, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a 75, 75, right? Mm -hmm. But on the next spot, well, I really can't go out that far. I want them closer because if I go out very far, then that area over there is tainted and I think they're going to come from there. Yes. So I, I go shorter. And then one thing that if I ever have the wind in my face, I'm always setting that call and what you did today, I'm always setting, because I, I recognize that. Remember when you're like, I was like, I know why you did that. You set the call out even farther because that brings that trap between you and the call. And they're, you know, whether they're going to come in left or right. And what's better than to have some coyote come in and hook around and staring at that caller coming in. And you're and sitting you're, right there. Yeah. <laughs> and he, yeah, he's not going to pick up your movement or nothing because his head's focused on that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Just don't let them cross where you walk. Yeah, right where you walk. So don't the let them best scent control is um, avoidance. Yeah. Don't let them get downwind of you because I guarantee you it's over. You may get a buck deer stand there and stomp. Coyote, it's like a like a brick wall. Like yeah, just flipping the switch and they're gone. Yep. So when I say 100%, percent i I'm talk. I thought you were saying like controlling where you're that's at why and how you're said, it. Yeah. That's why I said answer it because scent can control can be this or that. You yes. know, do you believe in the bottles and spray in IO, ISO? I mean, if you want to spend your money on it, go ahead. But I don't think it's going to do a bad, damn bit of good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it, it may, may fool a deer, but it ain't going to fool a coyote. It might, it might slow the reaction down of bolting as fast, but I really don't think it's going to do a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I think it don't matter. I mean, I like, like your you said, answer. If they get there, they won. Mm -hmm. Good for them. I like that answer. All right. So, Ozzy Clements, I think this will be our last question for the evening. Um, he says, what's your average size coyote in New Mexico? Um, you know, what... Why are the are they smaller or bigger? Yeah, they're 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 a pure western they're a pure coyote western bred. Um, I think coyotes size is based on two factors: the size of the prey they're eating, you know, and and um, how much they need to eat. You know, our winters aren't nothing like y'all's winters. You know, um, if this is Ozzy I'm thinking about, he's from Illinois. Um, Y'all from Missouri, it gets pretty damn cold, mm -hmm. right? Um, you're, around here, coyotes aren't going to prey on deer. They're going to prey on, on uh, bulls and, and rats and, and uh, rabbits. Um, I've, heard, I've heard that they eat grasshoppers out here. Gra oh, my God, yeah. Grasshoppers all there's, summer long. There's hardly anything a coyote awesome. won't eat. Yeah, in Iowa, dead winter, ice, ice cold out, shot a coyote. You know, he shit like crazy when I hit him. It was all corn. Like, yeah. like a cornmeal yep. sandwich laying there. Bugs, yep. frogs, yep. tadpoles, yeah. um, fruits. A lot of people don't so, know that they're fruity. Western coyotes, uh, I go into Arizona, which is just next door to us, and their coyotes are way smaller than ours. I go south of me to West Texas, their coyotes are way smaller than ours. Um, we've killed a 52-pound coyote here. That's not the norm. A big male, where you're picking him up and you're like, holy shit, he's heavy. <laughs> it's like 35 pounds. Um... Uh, average coyote probably 22 pounds, which is a pup in Illinois, and which is a damn baby in Maine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if we kill if we kill a big male, we're hitting 40, mm -hmm. 42. That that's a big male for us. That's a like oh, that's few and far between. Average male, 30. 30 yeah, 30. yeah, 28, 30. Then you get into your okay. This is a pretty good, pretty decent coyote. You're in between 30 and 35. You hit a 37 pounder. You're like that's a good one. Mm -hmm. If you hit a monster, you're at 40, 42. That's, you know, we don't get much bigger than that, I would say. <laughs> Females average 25, yeah. 22, 25. That 52-pound one we killed was tacky, like lard, stunk. Of course, my client wanted me to skin the damn thing uh. for him. <laughs> and um, he had this much fat oh, all the way around him. And he, you know, he smelled like he was living in a carcass. And I said, you don't get that fat from eating jackrabbits. Mm, yeah. I don't know how you get that he didn't fat want to share. He wasn't going to share that. Yeah. Would you say that the coyote size also depends on um, population? Don't know. I know it has to do with genetics and yeah. food type. And I, it would be interesting to know how, how long evolution took to get to that body size of that area. Mm -hmm. um, because my dad had always told me you could turn domestic pigs loose or they get loose. And in three generations, they will all look like feral pigs, the long snouts, and they just got that weird look to them in just three generations. So my thought would be if, if, there's, if you're overpopulated, they don't have near as much food source because their, their areas are smaller and they just may not have as much food source, where okay, if you go back to some place like, say, Missouri, that, I mean, we have a good population, don't get me wrong, but it's not as good as some areas like here or other places. They've got a larger area, less population. They got more of a food source. They can yeah. eat, you know, eat more than as much as they want. And that, I don't and that, know. And that could be. I always, I always had in my head that you know, um, Arizona's got the most coyotes. And this includes it. Arizona's mm -hmm. got the most coyotes of any place in the country, and they also got the tiniest ones. Mm -hmm. you know? So I wonder, you know, it could, I, I'm sure it's a, it could be a diet, a population thing. I always thought they don't get big because they don't need to. Right. They don't need to catch deer like up in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. So we had a couple of questions on our post. And they're pure coyotes. They're not crossbred with timber wolves, 
50, 100 years ago. Or That's a whole other story, isn't it? The mm -hmm. koi wolf, the, co the coyote dog, whatever. Koi dog. So we won't get into that one, though. Um, so, Raul Fiacci, if I pronounce that wrong, I'm sorry. I saw that earlier this morning you were locating, which we both like to do. Mm -hmm. um, do you prefer to do it in the first light rather than before sunrise? Before sunrise. Yep. Yeah. And, and what you've seen on live video, it wasn't as light as it looked on the video. Yeah, the camera, yeah, dark. the camera made it look like it was bright. Like, when the hell y'all aren't y'all on a stand? It, it was, was just. For, it was too dark for was, a stand. Yeah. Well, you got to realize too. Great light. You got to realize too when we're hunting together, we're filming. Mm -hmm. So if we're out there, we can't get filming then this much know. light, right? But nor, on a normal basis, I like to go. Well, we went out a couple hours before, and we hit our spots. Mm -hmm. I like to do it before sunrise. And I like to be on stand at sunrise. If we're filming, it's a little different story, but that's your your take on it too. Pretty a much. Absolutely, you know. Like I said, uh, in the spring when we're we're targeting dens for denning season, um, I like to go out and locate, and then you're going for the real aggressive pair that's pissed off that you're that you're howling. Um, <coughs> locating is an intricate part of of, of hunting them because you're you don't want to just be lapsed a daisy you know you know they're staying close to a den and you want to target them you want them to tell you where you're at and then you're going to hike in and you're going to sit down and you're going to play den raid and you're going to kill them <laughs> and you can get in a freaking rhythm like that boom mm -hmm. boom 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 so one thing that we've we've discussed too is once you find that trigger sound that day stick with it right I mean, it only makes sense. It's just like it, bass fishing. You don't take the lure off that yeah. you just caught last yeah. 17 bass with. And that goes, okay, and I, I want to go a little further with that too because it's a discussion that we've had and in, in online. It goes back with the, the, the sound volume, turning your call up and down when they're coming in. I don't know how many of pe people I've seen that a coyote's coming in. They're, I mean, they're on a string. They look down, they change the sound. <laughs> Why, why would you, you know, why would you do that? If that coyote's committed and he's coming in, don't touch the volume, don't touch the sound. But I've seen that where people switch sounds and you're just going, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to diss them or talk bad, but I'm just like, but it makes I don't, I don't, why. yeah, I don't do understand that. why. That if they're on a string, why? So it goes back to the same, the same thing, you know, and we've all done it. You, 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 you go through that, you're throwing the sink at them, right? Finally, you get that one sound. And I think it happened our first year. Remember, we, we had one cottontail that was just, I mean, it was money. Crispy cottontail. Yes. Well, boom, boom, boom. Like, let's, uh, you know, you don't throw everything out, but, man, that's where I'm going to focus on all of this out. day. Because today, And it's if it triggering. works, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it till it quits working. And if that means all the way till next season, that's perfect. Because who cares? You're getting a coyote to come in. That's your goal. So what yep. difference does it make what sound it is? Yep. Now you got to keep that in mind in your memory bank too, and then you got to think like guys like us. Well, I, I use crispy cottontail, or cottontail crispy on this one. I got to be careful. You know, I can't go back tomorrow and use the same sound. I need to give it some time or try something else. But I'm going to keep that in I my agree, memory bank. I agree with you a lot on if you got if you got an animal on the hook. Don't change the damn thing. You know, when, I, you when you were talking about it, you're, just you're, 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 you're applying one of those things that's really rare today. It's called common sense. Um, I was I was thinking of the analogy, if you're at a bar and there's a hot chick approaching you, you don't just say, oh, I'm going to hurry up and change my shirt. Yeah. What the heck? She's approaching you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? It's, it's don't good. change nothing. Yeah. So, Raul also asked, I have an area in our West Texas ranch that I love, and I know coyotes... And I know there are coyotes because we have killed them there before and because I have put bait and get, uh, got a few of them on camera. However, my last five to six stands over the last couple of years, even though I have tried different sound sequences, different hours of the day and stands at different places, I can't get them to show themselves. Any suggestions? A couple things. Five to six stands over two years. You know, we talked about animals running in cycles throughout just one day mm -hmm. so you know that's 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 a crap shoot if you called it five or six times in two years you may just not caught them on the wrong day there's so many times because I during the fall and winter I, I get to call almost every day um 
there's so many times that I see coyotes turned on on Wednesday and Thursday, and they're shut down on the weekend. And as a weekend hunter, it'd be like, this board sucks. <laughs> you know, literally, you know, you know, we saw 30 coyotes on Thursday, and then two on Friday and zero on Saturday because of the weather change or what have you. Um, so it's hard to do that. It's simple. You live in West Texas. West Texas, West Texas, you're going to have coyotes. There's, that's a huge population there. Um, I don't know, you know, there's there's too many unknowns. Uh, that's the person I have to talk to on the phone. Right. You know, are you day calling or are you night calling? You know, what's it, is it brushy? You know, you could be calling coyotes and you can't see. They're coming in, they're getting downwind. You may be watching upwind, not downwind, and they're all coming in downwind. And there's a lot. There's a lot of factors in that. There's one. a lot of factors. It's have, have you been busted? Have you been busted before? You I don't know, break you, the law. Right. You know, I mean, what's there's a lot of different, a lot of different. You oh, know. oh, you're okay. I'm sorry. I thought that was like you're reading the next question. Have no. you been boasted yet? <laughs> well, I, don't even, I don't even speed. No, it's just it's just one of the factors. I'm saying like there's yeah. so many Has factors. Has this guy that, been busted? Yeah. Has I, he been busted on yeah. stand? I mean, there's so many, so many different factors. I mean, it sounds like, you know, he's doing the right things. He's trying different spots. He's trying different sounds. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he sounds like he's doing the right thing. You know, it has the has the has the population went down there for some weird reason? I mean, he says he knows there's coyotes there, but well, and the, the other thing is, you know, everyone's definition of West Texas is different. My definition of West Texas is Midland, Odessa, and West. There's a lot of people say, "Hey, we're in the heart of we're in the heart of West Texas," and it, they're talking about Abilene. Well, shit, to me, Abilene is like <laughs> closer to East Texas, you know. Yeah. But to someone in Dallas, that's West Texas, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it all depends on what somebody. So we're all we're all just commenting. He said he, he wasn't busted. Um, it's an open bowl, and um, all day calling. Okay. You know what? I I live in a I live in a highly coyote population area. I have really good ranches. I manage my ranches. I don't overcall them. We may go into a uh, 50 section ranch and make five stands on it in the morning. You know, so I don't, it, they never get overcalled. Um, and how many coyotes did we kill today? Zero. You know, that's just coyote hunting. We, wow. may, we may go back to the same spots, probably won't, yeah, but we may go back that. to the same spots on Saturday and we may kill a dozen coyotes before 11 o'clock. Don't know. I think he's doing, I, you know, it sounds like five to six times in a couple years, he's doing what we what we talked about earlier. He's doing a good job of not overcalling not that overcalling over calling spot. But that could be a possibility of, are they holding coyotes? Is that place hold coyotes or is, are they coming through there? You know, there's, there's a big difference on that. So yeah. he may, that may not be, may not be enough for that, mm -hmm. that spot. Yeah, you know, if if it's coyotes coming through here and there, he may need to actually hit that one just a hair more, because I bet if he did hit that just a hair more, he'd have a little bit more. That may be not enough on that spot. Some spots are not enough, and some spots are way too much. You really, I mean, I don't know the situation on this one. I mean, he knows better than we do. Yeah, I mean, that, but, and, and, I mean, and a lot of it has to do with where where exactly is West Texas? You know, um, I've hunted in I've hunted in I don't remember where Scott used to live, but it's over by Mason, Texas. That's what's well, one of the toughest places in Texas to call a damn coyote. Um, you know, they've been they've been poisoned and shot at and trapped for 150 years, and they've got a hundred dollar bounty on them. And you know, everybody's trying to kill them. That's a really tough place to call coyotes. Yeah. Um, because there, that's I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's just whereas you go someplace like towards El Paso, and there's freaking coyotes everywhere there. You know, they're like rats. Um, and it may be nothing he's them. doing either. Um, Cody has a Cody has a big problem with a lot of contest hunters around him, right? I don't have as much. We have one contest in town, but I don't have as much. Well, that gets it's gets hard, hard for Cody in our area. I mean, there's as soon as deer season's over, January, February, March, sometimes even April, once or twice a month, there's a contest within sixty to eighty miles of my house. Yeah. So I lose so much property because of trespassers. Yep. Tons of that. Tons of trespassers. And the you know every contest is pulling fifty to sixty teams of four hunters. Yeah. You know. So yeah, then you're, and, you're, and, you're battling it, maybe educated coyotes. Yeah. You're battling a less population because a lot of coyotes. So you know you don't know what your neighbor is doing. If I've got a four hundred acre farm, three you know whatever, because it's different. 
if I've got that, I don't know what the guy's doing next door. I don't know what this right. neighbor how is doing. So it's not always something you do. You know, I would throw out raw if I if I was raw, I'd throw out what we went back to earlier. I throw out something that you know they've never heard. Just throw it up. I'll give you a good example. And you don't have to have that animal in your area. We've got snowshoe, snowshoe rabbit, guinea pig. I mean, all these. We don't have those. They're not wild animals in our area. It doesn't matter. Throw out something crazy. Coyotes hate foxes. They absolutely hate foxes. That, that it's funny you mentioned that too because um, one of the per, one of the gentlemen that was asking a question, Scott Sinow, he lived in Llano, Texas. Wanted me to come down. Hey, you want to come call my land with me, Bobcats? Hell yeah! Mm -hmm. Went down there and we targeted Bobcats. We went night calling. All we kept calling up was freaking gray fox, gray fox, gray fox. There are damn gray foxes everywhere, right? So we're on a stand, night calling, and coyotes started howling right up the hill. And I said, I thought you said there was no coyotes here, you know, in your county or whatever. He goes, no, we got coyotes, it's just you can't call them. Well, you don't tell me you can't <laughs> call them. So what? Challenge accepted. Simple. Coyote fox fight. That's got to happen once in a while. I started up coyote fox fight. Them so much just come roaring down the hill. Boom, he kills one. He was giddy. We started using that the rest of the night. And I think, yeah, I don't know, that was, he killed four or five coyotes. And he was giddy because they had like a $150 bounty on each of them. He made wow. good money. They hate foxes. But, yeah, I mean. Easy target. Th who would normally play coyote fox fight when, you know, you want to do your typical, I'm doing a baby cottontail mm -hmm. and then a woodpecker. Yeah. Um, that, leads, that leads into another question about um, do you do distress as your first sound on set or vocals at night? Generally, I most of my stands, I start with distress and I start small, like a baby cottontail, cotton teen, matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Work my way up with cadence and, cadence and, and uh, uh, what do you want to call it, pitch, to do it deep, all the way to something deeper. Because I'm looking to trigger these coyotes, kind of like when you're throwing a bass plug fishing, you're trying to figure out what they're striking on, you know. Um, and then from there, I'll go into my vocals. Normally, I change it up throughout the year. I might start with uh, I might start with howling, go into prey, and then finish with bites. Or some if I see that the bites are working, that's uh, the only sound I'll play. Um, so, I time, so time of year that was part of another part of this question is. Four seasons dictating which sounds you play. So tradition, yeah, traditionally, traditionally, um, I'll start with rabbit, finish with fights, howling and fights. Um, come breeding season, I reverse that. I'll start with howling and fights, and then I'll finish with rabbit. You know, and not too often you get something in on the rabbit because <laughs> that would have already came to right. the other sounds. Right. Um, springtime. I drop all of the prey and I do nothing but howl and puppy distress. Yep. I selfishly only want aggressive parents because I'm out there with my decoy dog and I want a show. I don't want this little sneaker that's last year, don't have pups yet, and all, you know, and mm -hmm. just wants to come in and get a cottontail. I could care less about that guy. Mm -hmm. You grow up, get fluffy, I'll yeah. see you this fall. <laughs> you know, I want that. Let them that things drop and then come back. <laughs> and then summer and then summertime, puppy distress. Simple as that. Yep. I've noticed in our area in Missouri that uh, our coyotes seem to be moved more vocal during the spring, summer, and early, early fall, late uh -huh. summer. They are more vocal. Do you? There's some you people see that, that only hunt during the spring, uh, during the uh, during the summer months. Everybody says you're no, crazy MF, being out there, MFK, but I love the MFK boys. They knock the shit out of them during like August. You yeah, know, when all the pups are running around and they're dumb as a box of rocks, and they're coming into vocals. You know, if you want to just kill a bunch of coyotes, I, I find they're very vocal, very very vocal mm -hmm. in the summer. Um, and I'm just like you. Uh, during the summer, I'm I'm using just some vocals, and I'm going right to a pup distress. And I, and I told you this, I think yesterday. One of my biggest keys was, and this was, you know, midsummer. If you can bear the hot, bear the mosquitoes, bear you know all the ticks and stuff like that. <laughs> it is a great time, and I've turned a lot of my friends on to cow hunting in the summer. That I was using a pup how. Mm -hmm. And after Pup Howl, I go to Deno Pups or Den Diner was my two. Man. And it was just, man, I was on a streak. I think one week I called 11 or 12 coyotes in and shot. With that combo? With just that combo. Mm -hmm. Found it. 
didn't worry about the cocktail, didn't worry about, the, you know what I mean? So I was, you know, and I didn't go to adult vocals. But adult vocals have become very successful in the summertime too because they do not want uh, anything, anything around their den mm -hmm. and their pups. So you can really get them on edge and get them very territorial in the summer with it too. Yep. So one other thing we want to talk about was we, we come up with dens. One of the misconceptions that I've found that a lot of people and landowners especially is they talk about having a den going setting up on a den in the middle of winter or in the middle of you know a non time they do not use their den year round no. they only use it to a short period of time to get them pups in and out right yeah I mean, and they the, don't and, and the time the ki the time the pups been in a den is really short you know like a month yeah so don't make that one of your you know your your locations and a reason for your why you're saying I can, so. the only thing i can think of i was thinking about this last night the only thing I can think of, you know, and I hear it all the time uh, when you pick up permission from a landowner, go back in that back corner, there's a bunch of den. Well, shit, it's like November, yeah. you know? Exactly. The only thing that you could, any kind of logic you could put about it, because that guy could give two shits about that den right now. They will come spring. Yeah. The only thing I can think of is they put dens in what they felt the safest area. So there may be, you know, that's the only logic I could put. And it's still their area. It's still their territory. It's their core. Yes. So it's no different than like going going to lay down in your bed, but then when you're when you're not in bed, you're still in your house and you're yeah. still in your living room. You're still doing things in your own area. Yeah. Um, but don't like if you see a den in November, don't like try to set up a stand on that den. Yeah. You're wasting your time. Yeah, you're wasting your time. So we had one more question on the post. Um, this was from Trenton Koshmar. Recently, I've had a bunch of come hard to the call jackrabbit distress usually coming straight into sight within three minutes so quick mm -hmm. car chargers but then they are hanging up not hearing any vocals from them they will pace side to side but never come in actually had one lay down behind brush for about 10 minutes mm -hmm. what would I try to bring them into range so how I'm, how I'm going to translate that is I'll break it down how I'm going to translate that is I've got coyotes that are in the woods and they won't come out I get a thousand questions just like that every year. A couple of things. Ooh, my nose itching. One, you may need to change the sound to kind of coax them out. There may not be anything you do. That's just a, how those mm. coyotes are. They can actually stand back in the woods 50 yards and look at that open field, and you can't even see into the woods 50 yards. Um, what I always said is, and, um, it, and it's usually guys in the Midwest, you know, they won't come out of the timber. They won't come out of the timber. Won't come. I said, they go in the timber with them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, use an electronic call. Put your call on that side of the field like you normally do. Hike on down. Get in that timber. If they always show up at that corner, but they won't break from there, be sitting right there. Take a shotgun with you. Take a rifle, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and kill them. <laughs> and that goes that goes back to kind of what we. Um we talked about too because your terrain is so much different and open than ours that we like to move on them you know so if we got I can't see you got a curtain mm -hmm. of we've got woods we, we can use our terrain we can use the woods we can use you know low you know get up move out move on if you have the option to do that you being so open it's really hard to do it once you're set up you're kind of committed to that spot for the most soon part. as you howl you're a target yep because even if all they do is look I mean, you can't you can't get up. Yeah. You can't walk to your truck and go get more ammo or anything. I mean, yeah. So we've noticed, you know, if we have one 300, 400 yards out, but man, he's firing off. He's pissed off. He's, I mean, you got his attention. You got, but he just doesn't want to break that line. And that line could that that could be exactly what it is. There's a line. There's a territory line between you and him. He doesn't cross that. That's not his. He's, he's coming into somebody else's territory, but he wants to let you know he's there, and he's gonna let he's gonna mouth you, but he's not gonna cross that line. Well, I will. I'll go to his line. I'll move on him. Then I'm within a couple, couple hundred yards, hundred yards. Boom! Here he comes. Boom! Right on top of you. I ain't afraid shooting. to fight you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You're in my territory. Yeah, we'll do it now. Up. So Across here's a line. quick, yeah. here's a quick little story. We were calling in Oklahoma, and uh, me and my buddy Scott, and this coyote. And we were hand calling, and this coyote was on the other side of the road, back along the creek, just giving us the stink. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I'm sitting there hand calling, trying to ignore him. He's just raising hell, trying to ignore him, trying to, you know. After like 
maybe five, ten minutes, I'm like, screw this. I said, keep calling. So he got in his hand call. I walked down the freaking road. I got in the creek. I walked that sand. And I got, and I spotted that coyote. He had a spot tore up that was probably ten foot circle. Just everything's tore up. It was pissed. And, oh, wow. And throwing his, you know, for jumping up in the air and that. And I shot him, <laughs> you know. But he, there was no way he was going to come, but yeah. I was just getting tired of him being yappy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I had one very similar hayfield, you know, back Midwest. We have a lot of hayfields, and, man, I love hunting hayfields. Mm, especially fresh. fresh cut, yeah. man. I'm, that's You know, they're always going to be picking up all the dead dead stuff, and they're always roaming those fields. Great visibility. You have good backstops to sit. So, And I can play the wind any way I want to with a hayfield. There's hay bales everywhere. I can make it work most of the time. With that being said, I had one that he was just, I mean, he just mouthing, mouthing, mouthing. And I knew it was a male because I mean, just tell by the tone. I, I pretty much knew, you know, and, and how ballsy he was. But he just would not come off that edge. He was just staying on that edge. And I just used the hay field and I moved in on him. And then all it took when I got to him, 50, 75 yards, lip squeak. I, I turned off. I left oh. the call. I left the call with me. I left the call where it was. I left it playing. And as it was playing, I'm slowly, you know, moving in. I get, and then all I that's did. A, that's part of that. Don't change anything. Don't mm -hmm. change anything. Mm -hmm. If I change something, then he might have moved, or he would have caught me. And then all I did was sit down beside the bell. I turned the call off. <laughs> Here he shot. Come right out of the timber. Boom. Bop. You know, because mm -hmm. I, I moved on him. I made him. I made him uncomfortable, in my opinion. You know, I think that's what what I did. And I got too close to him. But coyotes have that line, and it may not be doing anything they're doing wrong. You know. Change your strategy next time. Don't don't stay in the same spot. Yeah. So. I agree. Um, one last thing that I would like to talk about is one question that I get a lot is um, challenge house. Mm -hmm. How, so we talk. We we like to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. You know we're aggressive callers, but I think we're aggressive or we're smart enough that, you know, we most of the time we try not to spook them. One of the one of the conversations that came up a few years ago and I talked about and I hear people all the time is, you know, do you challenge them, in the breeding season. I, me personally, I don't challenge until they challenge me. Uh, that's what I was going to say. I'll answer them. We, and we talked about this. Yeah. It's going to be hard to use this analogy without cussing. So I'll say, screw you. Okay? You don't, you don't walk into a bar and just start saying, screw you. You know, that's what you're doing with a challenge how. I'm pissed off mm -hmm. and I'm telling you that I'm, you know, and I'll fight anybody who you know, gets in my way. Now, you don't just barge in a bar and do that. Um, but if some dude's doing it, you're going to yell back, well, screw you too. Mm -hmm. You know, the same thing. And that's how a fight is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And if you're wanting to, you got an aggressive coyote, um, that's wanting to fight, you're going to build that up. Mm -hmm. That's the only time you should use a challenge. Right. Towel. So if, if I'm sitting there and I, I start challenging, I may have a male that's, you know, one year old, uh, or less, or I mean, he may be that, that year's pup. Yeah. He's going to be like, mm, yeah, I'm out. So that was the kind of the conversation and the, and the argument that happened at that time. And a, a gentleman, I, I don't remember who it was, don't care. But they were saying, well, you're never going to scare one off. Yeah, you will. You're going to scare some younger, less dominant mm -hmm. males off. And I would even say that you might even scare some females off. But you're definitely going to scare the males off. Mm -hmm. So your, your odds are going to be better if you don't do that. And like you said, if that one guy goes, hey, I'm over here, screw you. I'll give it back to him. Yeah. Because he's probably pretty ballsy, you yeah. know, most of the time. Now, they don't always come in. It's not 100%, but they're probably pretty ballsy. Yep. But your odds are going to be, you're at pinpointing that one, but you may have scared off several others. You started it out and didn't do it. Because that other male may have come in to something else, and you might have had a, I know that another one. The other analogy which we were talking about was turkey hunting, right? Hmm. You, don't, you don't go on opening morning, and, you know, opening morning, you got turkeys in the tree and you're just going to do the softest little yip, 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 yip. you're not going to go nee, 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 you know, <laughs> yeah. and start like a, a pissed off mad cutting hen you know <laughs> you don't just you don't start that now now if you got one giving you shit yip, 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 or a tom's goblin you're going to just <coughs> hit him right on right. top and piss him off to make him come pick a fight with you it's same, no same different concept. it's no different than a buck or a turkey you know you, you get that boss hen mad well, you get that Tom mad. I mean, he's, he, he doesn't want you around. That's why you have a gobbler. That's why you have that kind of sound is because you're trying to get that Tom ticked off. Really hard to get him away from his females. Well, during breeding season, it's going to be hard to get that male away from. It's going to be that, hard to get him away from that male, right? He's got one thing on his mind, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's why it gets really hard in that January, February time because they're so locked up in focus. It's hard. It's like a, 
it's like a, a turkey. It's hard to get them away from their hands. Why would they leave? You know, if, if they're not an immediate threat and really super close, why do they need to leave? It's breeding season. So the women are like, we're going over here. And he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? No different than what we would do. And, you know? You know, exactly. And, you know, and I grew up learning about predator hunting. And, and I remember so many stories of guys talking about, like, man, the male cows are smart. They sent the female in first. Well, they didn't know that. One, they're probably slower. <laughs> but two, them female are mean as shit. Yeah, and they're just following them around because, well, they're like like us. We follow them around. Um, when a female comes into heat, she is a bitch, and uh, so and you learn how to use that to your advantage. Yeah. So I I would say that most of the time, like during the winter, I'm trying to I'm trying to tick her off more than I am, because if I can get her to come, mm -hmm. who's going to be following the male? Yep. Right. So the challenge how is one tactic, but. Like you said, I feel like the, the females are the ones that are the most territorial. And they're, the, I mean, they're the bosses, right? I mean, it's like the boss hand or like anything else, you know. They're then the matriarchs. Where, where are you going to find the bucks? You're going to find them with the does when they're in heat. That's where you're going to find them. Now, where that act, where that challenge ha happens and, and helps is, yes, you are territorial. You are there with their females. And sometimes you will pull that male. But just like a buck, you, you hit a doe ester, well, they're going to come. All right, so you try to get, I get that female out. You're going to get him to come if he's a single male. And you're going to get her to come because she's ticked off. So you get two, you get a twofer. Twofer. Mm -hmm. And then you get into, you know, like the the bucks. If you do a grunt or a or something to sound, they're going to be ticked off and come in. Mm. But it's going to be the females you're going to want to try to attract the most, right? Yeah. Was there any more questions, Chad? No more questions. I think we can wrap this up. Okay. Alrighty. Well, we appreciate you, Tony. We've had a good time. Yeah. And uh, this is fun. Oh yeah. We hope that you know somebody can kind of. You know, we're always we're always open up to listen to. I mean, we're always open to no matter. I think that's what make, goes back to making you a successful predator hunter is always trying to learn and take other people's knowledge. Oh, absolutely. The moment you think you know everything and that you're smarter than everybody and you want to pull out your Peter and have a contest, you're probably going to start losing something. You can always keep your mind open. Um, we're definitely not. You quit learning. You the quit best, but we learn. Simple as that. You know? And we like to go off our experiences. You know, we we don't kill the most coyotes out there, but we definitely do pretty decent. And you know obviously <laughs> you're the man you kill a lot of cows so it's always good to even if somebody is educated there's always maybe that one thing that they didn't know or didn't understand or didn't you know know how to absolutely. use it in their everyday a absolutely and i mean and everybody brings their something new to the table you know um i'm trying to think of an analogy there may be something about a coyote and how to trick a coyote that's held up or something like that and a guy who used to be a marlin fisher, is now a predator hunter. He's like, I wonder if he did this. Well, hell, <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah. He's thinking of it because he was brought up mm -hmm. with predator fish. You know, mm -hmm. who knows? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, if, yeah, if somebody's like just sits back and doesn't listen or doesn't absorb knowledge, then they're going backwards. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's always room. Hell, I, I, I try to listen twice as much as I speak. Yeah. Sometimes a hundred times more. <laughs> Yeah, and just try new things. Just if it's not working, mix it up, because obviously that's not working. So just common sense. Just try something totally different. I would say if you have a coyote hanging up, try it to a completely different sound. And if it don't work that day, move out. Go back and move on. Put a tongue cap fight sound or or, mm -hmm. a, or a distressed kitten. <laughs> who knows? It may be enough that they're like, "The hell's that? Mm, never heard know. that before." Let's go check it out. To hey, me, come it, on, guys, and yeah. the whole group comes. To me, that to me that's the thing. Well, I've heard this song and dance before, or you know. What is that? I, I think, you know, they say curiosity kills the cat. That's, uh, <laughs> I say curiosity kills the coyote just as much, you know, and I think that that's half the trigger is just curiosity. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they, they respond positively and negatively to, to changes. Um, and I can go on a bunch of stories on that, but I know we're trying to wrap this up, so I won't. So we appreciate you tuning in. Yeah. We hope that, uh, you know, you guys enjoyed um, getting to pick our brains and especially Tony's brain. And I just sat around and listened to people talk about predator hunting. We were supposed to do this outside and stuff, but that all changed with the storms. But um, yeah, you can't have this with thirty some mile per hour winds. <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, and that with the same thing, it, it really dampened our hunting today. It, it might do it tomorrow. Um, but that's the yeah. thing, you know. We're, we we appreciate you guys here. Um, we can we can go on forever, and we're going to try not to do that because I know you guys are like me. It's once you get going on a subject that you like and. 
that you have a passion for it goes on and on and on. And there's so um, many factors that we can't even cover. I'm biting my tongue right now from talking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. We hope that you learned something. This will be back on um, on uh, our show. We hope you guys tune into the job, which is a uh, our our predator hunting show. We're actually yeah, going to have. Yeah, if you some... don't if you don't watch that show, you're missing out. Yeah, that's how I found these guys. I'm like, they're putting on some quality stuff, you know. I'm really tired of watching Facebook uh, thermal scope videos. <laughs> I mean, after I watched the 11,000th one, I'm pretty bored of them, you know. Um, and I get lots of people send them to me. Hey, man, check it out. You know, they're coming to Denrate. I'm going to want to see how it reacts. But they're all kind of the same damn thing, you know. Um, and then these guys have, like, it's a total different variety and high quality and well-produced um, and that's why I'm like, we're just your average Joe's out doing what we love and having that's fun. That's what I like, cause, mm. <laughs> you know, it don't get much more average well, to me. I'm a goddamn redneck that raises coyotes and records them howling. <laughs> and we show you our misses. We don't care to show you misses because everybody misses mm -hmm. some more than others, but we do, and we, we do it. We try to just be um, just ourselves. You know, we we all have families. Um, we all full time jobs. Well, full time jobs. We have families, but we love doing what we do, and you know we we've, we've grown a lot over the years. And uh, you're down to earth, and you don't have big heads. I wouldn't be sitting here right now if you guys were big headed. We try not Simple to. That's that. something that drives us crazy because there's so many factors into all that. But anyway, we'll we'll leave yeah. that alone. Um, we'll try not to get into battles. But um, with that being said, we hope you guys tune in. We got some good coon hunting action oh. coming up. Um, that's Just really wait. funny. Just wait for those. Before we go, Tony. Top five Tony Tebby sounds. Top five? Top five. Or ten. Whatever you want to do. Tell us what your top sounds are. Cotton Teen. Cotton Tail Crazy. Den Raid. Den Doom. Oh, yeah. Which is it's really climbing the ladder quickly. Quickly climbing Very the quickly. ladder. And now I need a vocal. Like if you said, hey. Make them talk. Take a caller. Well, no, you take a caller and oh. you can only have five sounds. I, I need a. Meet and greet. I'm going to say perfect pair. Oh yeah, that's good. I think I could go take those five sounds, and did you notice I didn't say cottontail candy? That was my freaking bad bread yeah. and butter. I always said den raid cottontail candy. Only two sounds I need to kill coyotes. Then I was like, well, that's a pretty damn dumb thing to say to somebody who sells sound pipes. <laughs> <laughs> well, hell, he said I only need to buy those two. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, those five sounds I can go anywhere in the country and kill coyotes with them. What's your top five? Um. Den Raid, Cotton Teen, uh, Make Them Talk, Meet and Greet, and uh, probably... I, Pupalooza. I was going to say that, Pupalooza, I was going to say that one or that uh, Coyote, or the Pup Distress 2. Mm. That one's always been on my favorites list. Yeah, I think and it's I, an old one too. I think I recorded that probably back in 2012. I was gonna say because I remember whenever I've got it, whenever I went to update it, it said it'd been on there for I think eight years, and I still use it. Make them talk. Two. Make them talk. Um, Den raid, of course. That's gonna be a across the board favorite. Um, because I'm a coyote or coon hunter also. i got to go with the uh, coyote coon catch. Mm. I was going to say, I would be surprised if you didn't say that. Coyote coon catch. Um, Din Doom is becoming one of my favorites. And then that kind of goes with Puppa Palooza. That's kind of a tie for me right now. Kill a lot on Puppa Palooza. Um, vocals? Vocals, well, that would be the make them talk. Mm -hmm. um, Canty howls are pretty good. I, see, I'm not going to go too far. I'm just trying to go with what I've had the most success with. And then I'm with... with I'm gonna go with um, Wee Wee Rabbit. Nice. I really like Wee Wee Rabbit. Bar nice. Bunny is another one that's climbing the list for me. But Wee Wee, I, I think that's got the great. I call uh, good I call the litter of pups that are only about that high, seven of them, and they climbed up in a freaking tree to get to Wee Wee Rabbit. The first time I played it, I'm like, Ooh, I like this song. Yeah. It didn't have a name. I'm like, oh, it's like a wee 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 rabbit. <laughs> freaking coyote pups. We didn't even shoot at any. I'm never too damn cute. Mm. I'd, I, I know we're going, guys. Uh, w what was it? Meet and greet that we had thirty some stands in a row that we have. Yes, oh, yeah, and, yeah, during, yeah, the and day, during the day, thirty some stands in a row that we led the stand let it out, and they reacted every single time. Nice. Now some of that dictated the time of night and mm -hmm. stuff that we had, and then even on my own, 
He told me about it, and I'm like, eh, okay. We'll okay, see. go to locating calls. Oh, locating? That's easy. Make them talk. Family affair. Family affair. And elite female. Fem yeah, you. I heard elite female today for the first time, yep. and it's going on my call as soon as we get back. Yep. They will. Yep. I guarantee you, I would bet somebody $10,000 I can make my pet coyotes howl and I'll show you on, on elite female. And I could go down the road a mile and a half and play it, and they're going to howl. That elite Guaranteed. female, like year-round too, right? Mm -hmm. Year-round, doesn't matter what time of year that one's just... Yeah, it makes them howl. And that's something to be said, because not every sound will trip them up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when we heard that one this morning, yeah, or yesterday morning, I thought, what in the world? I hadn't heard it. I just overlooked it, but... Sorry, they're laughing ass. They want us to wrap it up, but yeah, we gotta get. They're hungry. Too much fun. We we could talk. We could talk about this all night long. I do. Yeah. Okay, I? sounds like a plan. <laughs> yeah. Bring the pizza in. Right. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it, guys. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank y'all. All right. See ya.